Nestled in a crescent of land where the Pacific Ocean meets California's Monterey Peninsula, Pebble Beach is a place that inspires passion. To many people, that passion means golf, as the famed Pebble Beach Golf Links recently hosted the U.S. Amateur Championship and next year will welcome its sixth U.S. Open. But once each year, the 18th fairway at Pebble Beach is given over to the passion for the world's most elegant, innovative, and stylish automobiles, not merely on display, but in competition. In pre-World War II Europe, an event was created to showcase both the newest models from Continental Car Builders and the hot couture of the world's great fashion houses. It was called a Concorde d'Elegance. Amid the conflict, the idea disappeared. It was reborn on the west coast of the United States in 1950, and soon classic cars were honored as part of a day of sports car racing on local roads. Within a few years, the races moved elsewhere, while the Pebble Beach Concorde d'Elegance flourished. In addition to shifting from new cars to classics, Pebble Beach turned the focus from mere display to a competition focusing on meticulous restoration, engineering, and style. The annual selection of the cars rose to the highest standards, the judging the most exacting. The result is the unmatched quality of the rare and priceless automobiles each year. This year, once again, more than 200 rare and historic automobiles have arrived from around the world to compete for the most coveted title in the collector car industry, the honor of being named Best of Show. They represent familiar classic marks, such as Duesenberg, Cadillac, Ferrari, and Mercedes, plus the whimsical flair that is unique to Pebble Beach, including the debut of exotic creations for the noble families of India, the fabled American Tucker, and the innovative French Citroën. The stage is set. The judges have made their selections. Join us now as we honor the very best of the very best at the 2018 Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance. On a typically beautiful, warm, sunny, and breezy California day, the world-renowned Pebble Beach golf links have been remade into the focus of the collector car world at the site for the 68th edition of the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance. Hello everyone, I'm Bob Varsha, and once again this year, it's my pleasure to host our streaming coverage of this great automotive event. If you're not familiar with the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance, you should know that it is the end cap on a week of jam-packed automotive-related events all over California's Monterey Peninsula, from vintage cars on the racetrack to single mark concours here and there around the peninsula. There are also forum discussions, art exhibitions, six major collector car auctions that you'll be reading about in all of the automotive magazines around the world in the days to come, and a whole lot more. It's an absolute bucket list week for any fan of the automobile. Now, moments ago here at the Pebble Beach Golf Links, Derek Hill, the MC for the Concours d'Elegance and son, of course, of the great Formula One champion and car restorer Phil Hill, introduced the team of honorary judges to the audience that's collected here to see these beautiful cars. Some 50 automotive experts make the initial decisions on which cars will cross the stage and one of them will be selected for best of show. Now, joining me once again, I'm pleased to welcome the International Bureau Chief for Motor Trend, Angus McKenzie, and everybody's favorite automotive expert and raconteur, Alan Decadene. Angus, great to be back at Pebble Beach. What are you looking forward to? Absolutely, and I think from what I've seen walking the lawn this morning, this is gonna be a blue ribbon year. There are some absolutely fantastic cars here, which might sound unusual given we always see always fantastic cars. cars here, but I really think this year, it's stepped it up a notch. There's some truly stunning machines out there with some fabulous stories to tell. Alan, how about you? You know, guys, I'm very big on uh, tradition and heritage. And if there's one event of this nature that's steeped in both of those, it's Pebble Beach Concorde d'Elegance. An unbelievable selection of cars. I met a lot of old friends out there this morning walking around. Most of them have two legs, but quite a lot of them had four wheels. I'm really looking forward to this show, it's gonna be fantastic. Let's talk a little bit as our parade of elegance is about to begin about what's new and different about this year's event. The Pebble Beach Concord Elegance always wants to evolve with new things for people to enjoy each year. And they have a handful this year. They do, and I think there's some uh, always new classes that come up at uh, Pebble Beach. And this year, 
new classes that we're seeing, the Eisenhower Dream Era Convertibles. You know, the 1930s were the Gilded Age of American automobiles, but the 1950s were also there. That was the Rocket Age of automobiles. And so we've got some fabulous convertibles from there. Um, we've got post-war cu custom Citroens. And I know when Johnny Lieberman uh, walks the field, uh, he's going to be all over those cars. Fabulous cars. And we've got uh, a, a collection, the largest gathering of Tuckers, I think, that there has ever been and likely ever to be, something like 13 cars, plus a selection of cars from the 1960s Indianapolis 500. And amazing race cars and an amazing evolution of technology in such a short space of time. There's some fantastic, fantastic cars. Now let's introduce the other two members of our all hands on deck Motor Trend team for this year's Pebble Beach Concours de Elegance. Please welcome Editor-in-Chief Ed Lowe, and Senior Features Editor Johnny Lieberman. Welcome, guys. Thanks, Thanks. Bob. It's such a pleasure to be here, as always. Again, as you guys mentioned, a spectacular, uh, you know, culmination of a spectacular week. The Sunday here at the uh, Concorde d'Elegance. Uh, great weather, a bit breezy, uh, but, you know, keeps us cool. And, uh, you know, as the guy said, you know, just some fantastic machines out there on the lawn. Yeah, just echoing what you and Angus said, I mean, the quality, you wouldn't think it. Like last year, they thought that was the best cars in the world. And this year, they're kind of better, you know. And as always in August, there's nowhere I'd rather be than right here at Pebble Beach watching the show. Absolutely. Now, one of the other new elements of this year's show, and you'll hear more about it later, is the JAI, the Japanese Automotive Invitational, celebrating the Japanese nations and its car culture's contributions to the automobile. There are some fabulous examples out here, and we'll have more on that a little bit later on. Right now, the Parade of Elegance continues, a carefully hand-selected group of cars that demonstrate what the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance is all about, which is craftsmanship in the restoration, originality, authenticity, and style. Yeah, and it's it's not a speed competition, but the cars actually have been on the road, the, uh, the Tour d'Elegance, which happened on Thursday. Um, cars that do participate in that, if there is a dead heat in the judging, if there is a tie on points, then the car that has competed in the Tour d'Elegance will get the nod. Um, so it's been fantastic to see these cars in motion. And uh, uh, Concours is, is very much about authenticity. It's the technical merit and the style of the car and uh, the way it's been restored, the respect for the tradition and the heritage of the past. Now, if you look at the, the staging area as the cars pass across the stage, you'll see hundreds of people camped out. Many of those people have been here since dawn's early light this morning to get the best possible perspective on the fabulous collection of cars that will cross the block. Once the initial judges' selections are in, the third, second, and first place cars in each of our two dozen classes will cross the block. There they will be judged as they go by by another selection panel, and one of those cars will be selected as best of show. The tension builds right to the very end, and we hope you'll be with us for it. I'd like to take a moment and recognize a family that has competed at the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance longer and with more success than any other. This family has spent 60 years with us and has taken home six best of show trophies. That's right, six. J.B. Nethercutt started that tradition when he happened upon his first collector car back in 1956, a DuPont in awful condition with bumpers missing and fabric flapping out of the window. He bought it nonetheless and spent 19 months restoring it. That car was named Best of Show here in 1958. For the past 14 years, their son Jack and his wife Helen have carried on the Nethercut family tradition, bringing us several fantastic cars. Thank you, Jack and Helen, for your devotion and dedication. This was the first Hispano owned by our former co-chairman, Jules J. Human, who once said that winning best of show in this car in 1972 was surely the most thrilling day of his life. We want to take this moment to honor Jay and all that he did for the cars, for this Concours and for the collector car world. Jay, along with Lauren Tryon, worked passionately for nearly three decades to make this Concours the best it can be. He was responsible for bringing together 
the Bugatti Royales in 1985. He became our chair and emeritus, and even in his 90s, he helped us get a new perpetual trophy. We owe Jay a great debt, and we want to express our thanks to his family, to his daughters, Leslie and Jan, and his wife, Barbara. Thank you for sharing Jay with us. The 28 classes here this year, uh, more than 200 vehicles, more than 68 different automotive brands. And, you know, we talk about the auto industry and how it's changed. Uh, of those 68 brands, there's probably only 21 of them that are familiar to people today, 21 known to exist. Uh, it's a fascinating industry. It's an industry that consumes a lot of money. And there's been a lot of uh, broken hearts and shattered dreams from entrepreneurs trying to get into the car business over the years. Well, we often say the cars come from far and wide, and it's, it's no joke. 17 separate countries, 31 states here in the USA have entries to cheer for at this year's event. Now, of course, the first Concours was held here in, in 1950 at Pebble Beach in conjunction with the road races, but it's been held right here on the lawn in front of the lodge since 1952. And in 1955, um, Derek Hill's father, Phil, um, he had a 1931 PS Arrow here that won uh, Best of Show. And that set a theme that's been present ever since, more than 30 years, only twice has a post-war car won best of show here. Will this be the year? I'm not sure. The pre-war cars here this year are, as we've talked about, they're over the top. They're amazing this year. Well, fair warning to our entire team. I'm going to ask for predictions about this year's best of show winner. You've just given a bit of a clue as to where you ought to direct your attention when you make your pick. Now, while ceremonies continue up on the stage, we want to call your attention back to last year's best of show winner. Cars are such a part of, you know, human advancement, and uh, there's a lot of cars, a lot of stories. And often the story is more interesting than the car. I'm the oldest, so I was probably the bad influence over my other brothers, and, and uh, we, we had a lot of fun when we were kids. Early on, I mean, I, I got into vintage racing, and, uh, started acquiring different interesting cars to drive in the vintage races and it sort of builds a collection and my brother john i think was the next one to really get interested and he started vintage racing and craig came along a little later and he got deeply involved in it you know i, I think a part of it's just growing up you know enjoying driving i don't think there's any rivalry between us it's just something that i guess was sort of innate in us we've all taken great cars to pebble and that's what's sort of ironic about last year. You know, I don't think any of us are driven to sort of go there to try and win. I never have been. I, I'm not aware of any time that two brothers have ended up going for best of show and, until I think uh, Alan Decadene came over and asked what it was like competing with my brother. In an interview, I think that was the first time I sort of thought, I guess we are competing. And Chip Connor was the other car up there and he's a good friend of both of ours. So it was sort of interesting that three good friends are sitting there with three totally different cars. And, you know, I don't think I realized until just a very few minutes before that this was the best of show lineup and uh, one of the three of us was going to win. And then I thought, they're all great cars. Any one of them certainly could have been up there. And I guess I got lucky. This year we're taking a, a Type 46 Bugatti that I bought in Europe. Two or three years ago, I just sort of became enamored with the car. And it's a nice, honest car that was restored quite a few years ago, but it's a very presentable car. And, um, and then a Lotus 34 racing car that was quite a famous car with uh, Jimmy Clark, Dan Gurney, A.J. Foyt, and Parnelli Jones all drove the car and had several wins and a lot of poles. And I thought it was a really interesting car and, and a real piece of history. I mean, to me, cars, the attractive thing about cars at the end of the day are the people. And the people at Pebble, there's so many fascinating people. And the cars are what pulls everybody together. I mean, people come from all over the world for that event. It's, you know, it's a real crossroads. And I don't think there's anything that really competes with it. But again, it's, you know, I've had so many friends involved with it for so many years. It's. It's just a chance to see a lot of great, nice people and have some fun with them.
Well, at Bruce McCaw, he and his family are back once again this year with another fabulous car. Right now, our top three cars in each of our classes is taking to the stage. So let's pick up the action there. The winner in Class A for Antique Cars, a 1910 Thomas Flyer M645 passenger touring. And of course, Thomas is uh, Thomas Flyer. A lot of people may remember a movie, The Great Race, well, in 1908 car two years younger than that one, uh, older than that one, competed in the great race, which literally was a race from New York to Paris, 13,000 miles, and it won the event. It was nowhere near as glamorous as the movie, and there was no um, dick dastardly in, in the evil machine, but uh, it was quite an achievement. And uh, this six-cylinder model um, was first demonstrated in 1909. They took all the gears out except top and reverse and made it climb up and down a bunch of mountains uh, in the Adirondacks and in through, back through to Buffalo. So quite an impressive car back in the day. And it, this is not the actual model who won the Paris, uh, the New York to Paris race. That is in the Hera Collection, the National Automobile Museum in Reno, Nevada. I've seen it and I investigated that story and it was a huge story at the time because a New York Times correspondent rode with the car across America up to Alaska yep. once it jumped the Bering Strait to, to go into Asia and continental Europe. So everybody that read the New York Times was reading about this fabulous car and all that it accomplished. So as class winner, the Thomas Flyer goes into the hopper, as it were, for best of show. Moving on to our next class, B for vintage era sporting. In third place, a 1923 Steyr Type 6 Targa Florio Rennwagen. This is a fantastic car because uh, Steyrs are very rare. Um, the company got merged with Daimler and Puch, but Steyr still builds cars today. Uh, Magna Steyr actually makes the Jaguar I-Pace, the Jaguar E-Pace, and BMW 5 Series. And over the years, they've made cars for almost every car company in the world. So it's still, it's still here. Fabulous color. Now moving up center stage, second in Vintage Era Sporting, 1921 Page Model 666, Daytona Speedster. What a fantastic name, Daytona Speedster. And it, it's because a stripped down production uh, a version of this car actually reached a speed of 108.5 miles an hour at Daytona in 1921. I mean, that's getting on. Think about that, yeah. yeah. That would have been quite a ride. So a fantastic name and not the, not the first and not the last car to be called Daytona. Uh, of course, that wasn't on the Speedway, which wasn't built till around 1950. That was on the sands of Daytona Beach with the Atlantic Ocean lapping at the tires. And taking the victory in Vintage Era Sporting, 1921 Kissel 645 Gold Bug Speedster. This nickname Goldbug came from a, a journalist who ran a promotion in the Milwaukee Journal in which a young girl called the car a gold bug due to its color. And uh, it was considered one of the 100 top sports cars of all time. And most expensive models were equipped with Kissel's Hollywood option of nickel plated bumpers and an exhaust cutout. And you just imagine that echoing through uh, the Hollywood streets, you know, no muffler and an open exhaust. Those were the days. And if you've been following the long road to Monterey at motortrend.com, you are very familiar with the gold bug and the creative workshop in Dania Beach, Florida. You've seen that car restored, and here it is. Moving on to Class C1, American Classic Open. In third place, 1932 Auburn 12 160A Phaeton. And this is an era, this is the gilded age of the American automobile from the late 1920s through to World War II. You had straight eight, V12, and even V16 engines with extravagant coach-built uh, bodies on them. And of course, um, Eric Lobben Cord's uh, Auburn Automobile Company launched its own V12 to compete with Lincoln, PS Arrow, and Cadillac. And that was uh, the engine that powered this car. It was really an arms race in terms of cylinders and engines back in the day. Just think, $1,795 new back in 1932. Second place in the class, a 1935 Auburn 851 Supercharged Speedster, a very familiar silhouette. Absolutely, at one of the most iconic American cars from the 1930s, uh, designed by, styled by ex-Jusenberg uh, designer Gordon Burick, 
Um, and it's considered to be his masterpiece. I mean, it, it looks like it's doing 100 miles an hour standing still. I mean, look at how low that hood is. You barely just got the arm hanging out there. And uh, of course, the, the pipes coming through the side uh, of the hood there. Just a fantastic profile on that car. Beautiful machine and actually owned by one of the company's test drivers back in the day. I think that's all the imprimatur I need. And first in class, an American Classic Open. Check this car out. I'll give away my pick right now for best in show. It is this 1937 Cadillac Series 90 Hartman Cabriolet. This is an utterly extraordinary car. It looks like it's bodied by Fagoni and Falashi, but in fact was built by a, a Swiss bodybuilder called Hartmann on a Cadillac 90 V16 chassis. Uh, the thing is 22 feet long and uh, was ordered by a Swiss uh, playboy who wanted to uh, impress his buddies to get something that was bigger and flashier and faster, and I think he certainly succeeded. This car was uh, shown at 1936 Paris Salon. Um, it was parked in 1939 after it had been involved in several accidents. It was probably a little too big to drive on, on European roads, and it fell into disrepair. And after uh, many, many years, it was bought for the princely sum of $925. Imagine that. It went but through a lengthy and thorough restoration by noted collector Jim Patterson. And it's great to see it here. It is just stunning. We'll move on to our next class, C2, American Classic Closed. In third place, a 1931 Marmon 16 sedan. And the 16 in this uh, instance is the number of cylinders under that hood. Yes, it's a Marmon uh, V16 and uh, it was built as the world's most advanced motor car and it was a rival to Cadillac's V16. So it's an eight litre overhead valve 16 cylinder engine, had uh, 200 horsepower and a typical V16 with a saloon body like that was capable of 95 miles an hour. It doesn't sound much today, but that's a lot of automobile to be uh, punting along at those speeds. Eight liter overhead valve, 16 cylinder engine making 900 horsepower. And now rolling up as all the class placing cars must do under their own power. Second in American Classic Closed, a 1930 Ruxton C. Edward G. Budd Manufacturing Company sedan. Unusual name. It is, but uh, you know, Ruxton's, uh, we've commented on these before. There was a class here uh, recently on Ruxton's advanced car, front wheel drive, and a very low, long body line to them that was most unusual. Not many were built. It was meant to uh, compete with the Cord L29. Um, Less than 100 Ruxtons were actually produced, and the paint scheme on this car is designed to make it even look even longer and lower than, than normal, and uh, a pretty spectacular car. Look at the proportion. The hood on that car is almost as long as the cabin. <laughs> One of only 19 known to survive. Moving on to the class winner, eligible for best in show, this 1938 Packard 1604 Super 8 Mayfair Coupe. Yeah, Packard uh, was uh, the last word in American luxury, and uh, this Super 8, uh, they managed to survive through the Depression quite well by, by offering eight-cylinder as well as 12, V12 engines. And uh, this car has a, um, an eight-cylinder engine in it, a straight-eight engine. What's interesting about this one is it has an English body on it. It was sent to the Mayfair Carriage Company in London for that body. So you can see in the vernacular of the design, it, it, it has a very different look to it. it. It most definitely is an English body. It kind of, in profile, could be something from a Rolls-Royce or a Bentley. A very large car, but only two doors. Really, really interesting uh, window line on that car too. The uh, rear window drops down. The rear passengers get a great, uh, great view of the road. Moving on to class D for Packard. In third place, a 1937 Packard 1508 12 convertible sedan. Well, Packard was once the last word in American luxury, big formal stately cars. They're almost like an American Rolls Royce. So it, it's appropriate. It's always had a, a class here at uh, Pebble Beach uh, for its all Packard vehicles. And uh, this particular car, 15th series, um, it was uh, a 12 cylinder car and uh, 
among the most popular 12-cylinder cars, surprisingly, uh, sold in America. You wouldn't have thought there would have been much of a market for it in, in the 1930s, Depression-era America, but Packard managed to survive. Especially selling at over $5,000 a copy. Second in class, rolls to center stage, a 1932 Packard 904 Deluxe 8 Dietrich Convertible Victoria. The, uh, the Packard was offered with 21 different body styles and including six designs by Raymond Dietrich and this is one of those cars. This is a rare Dietrich built for a Victoria and one of only four eight-cylinder model 904 Deluxe 8 convertibles produced by Packard this year. It has a, a 135 horsepower 384 cubic inch inline straight eight engine so that accounts for that long hood line. There's a lot of engine under there. A very formal looking car, very imposing looking car, typically Packard. And finishing first in class, a 1931 845 Deluxe 8 Derham convertible Roadster. And it's the eight cylinder Packards are doing well in the class this year, another, another eight cylinder car. And uh, this one has a number of special features in it, including a, a crank down top. Um, which added $100 to the price tag. Now you think of options these days as uh, you know, costing you thousands of dollars, but back in the day, $100 was a considerable amount of money to, to uh, lash out on an option. Other unique features are the dual mounted uh, rear spares and the chrome hood doors that uh, add to its sporty nature. You know, Pat Packards weren't really sporty cars, but this is as sporty as it gets. And this is the third appearance at Pebble Beach for the car, the first in 1982, the second in 1999, and this time it takes first in class, eligible for best of show. Of course, Packard founded in 1929 in Warren, Ohio, and uh, it had a, uh, a reputation for engineering, built V12 engines for Mustangs and uh, Spitfire fighter planes during World War II. On to Class E. In third place, and for the Rolston Coachwork class, a 1935 Duesenberg SJN Rolston Convertible Coupe. Yeah, each year Pebble uh, Beach Concourse celebrates uh, one of the great coach builders. Once nearly all cars were coach built. You had a chassis and someone put a body on top. Uh, by the 1930s, coach built cars were for luxury vehicles. Um, although the, the practice is making comeback in the, in the 21st century. Rolston was actually founded in New York, uh, located on West 47th Street, and the name actually came from the partner's admiration for the Rolls-Royce that was built in Springfield, Massachusetts. So, hence Rolston, Rolston name. Rolston, one of the premier coachwork builders out of their New York factory in the 20s and 30s. Finishing second in the class, now entering the field and up onto the ramp, a 1931 Minerva Type AL Rolston convertible sedan. Minerva is a name not many people will have heard of. It's a Belgian luxury car built during the 1920s and 30s. And this is the only uh, known Minerva AL with American coachwork. So it's got a 6.5 liter eight cylinder engine um, I think they were night sleeve valve engines which had valves down the side of the piston bores which made them very quiet and very smooth. And the, uh, this is a very elegant car. Um, the rake of the windshield and the side pillars were matched to give the car the impression of speed even while it was standing still. This car, one of several double winners, picking up both a class honor and a special award. This car wins the Classic Car Club of America trophy, awarded to the most significant classic car present. Both those awards being presented now. And we await the arrival of the class winner in the Rolston Coachwork Class E. The Rolston bodies were uh, re regarded as uh, one of the strongest ever in the classic car era. They were very well engineered, very solid bodied cars. And here comes the class winner, a 1934 Duesenberg SJ Rolston Convertible Victoria. 
Duesenberg SJ, in some ways, you could say it was the Bugatti Chiron of its era at a time when most cars would struggle to make 60 miles an hour an ordinary car. This car could do 140 miles an hour. <laughs> Absolutely extraordinary. Supercharged straight eight engine with 320 horsepower. And of course, the Rolleston body, one of the signatures on those cars, is the big mesh area on the side of the hood. And you can see just ahead of the wheels there, the mesh, you can look right through and see that magnificent engine. That car comes from noted collector Bob Bear from Paris, Maine. The name sounds familiar and you're a racing fan. You know Bob Bear as the man who put New Hampshire International Speedway into pride of place on the NASCAR Monster Cup, Monster Energy Cup, I should say, schedule every year. Now, moving to class F1. Motor Cars of the Raj, a very special class this year. This one limited to Rolls-Royce and Bentley vehicles. In third place, a 1935 Bentley three and a half liter Anthem Drophead Coupe. And for me, this is one of the standout classes at Pebble Beach this year. The Raj, it's a Hindustani word for rule and it uh, signifies the period between 1858 and 1947 when the British had direct rule of India. But India itself, a country with a history going back 5,000 years, was basically a patchwork of 700 princely states. And some of them were quite wealthy and they splurged on wonderful cars in the early 20th century. And this car was uh, uh, displayed at the Paris show in 1934 and uh, was uh, sold to the Maharaja of Tulcha who loaded the car into a troop ship and sailed it to Calcutta in 1942. I know that the Pebble Beach chairman Sandra Button and her crew are terribly proud to have this contingent of great coachwork cars from India. A first for the Concours. Second in class, a 1937 Rolls Royce 2530 HP Gurney Nutting All Weather Tourer. And this car is one of three identical cars shipped to India before World War II, and all three survive today. And this actual car was used by Rolls Royce in its advertisements in Indian newspapers. And the winning car in class, also a Rolls Royce, a 1935 Phantom II Continental Gurney Netting Streamline Coupe. This is actually the poster car for Pebble Beach Concours this year, this car, and it uh, it's, uh, was sent to Gurney Nutting on behalf of the Maharaja of Jodhpur, who specified the green and cream paintwork that you see there today. That were his official state colors. And the car was delivered to uh, Bombay in October 1935. Um, this particular uh, Rolls Royce is um, one of five Phantom II Continentals exported to India and the last of 280 uh, Phantom uh, Continentals built by Rolls Royce. Also, another double winner picking up the Lucius Beebe Trophy for the Rolls Royce, considered most in the tradition of Lucius, a bon vivant, served among the early judges here at Pebble Beach. An absolutely spectacular car. The color scheme is really makes it stand out. It, it's got such a presence, that car, and well worth being the uh, poster car for this year's Concours. Now the Raj, you know, the, the cars, there were a lot of Rolls Royce and Bentleys sent to India because the roads weren't that great. and. Uh, the Rolls-Royce and Bentley cars had a reputation for durability. They were able to cape, cope with the roads. So it's unusual to see so many cars uh, other than Rolls-Royce here. And uh, the cars of the Raj that they've bought up now um, are interesting because they're not Rolls-Royce or Bentley, which is... That's right. This is class F2 for non-Bentley or Rolls-Royce motor cars of the Raj. This is a 1930 Stutz M LeBaron four-passenger speedster, third in the class. And it was ordered off the stand at the London Motor Show in, in 1929. And uh, it's one of the few Stutzes built from new in right-hand drive. Of course, uh, in India, they were the same as the, the British market. It was used for long-distance travel, and it's one of the, 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 the only known Stutz in India. Well, at this point, we will go to the stage. Now we want to take this opportunity to present this year's Lauren Tryon winner. The Lauren Tryon Award is presented to a car enthusiast who has made significant contributions to the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance and the collector car world. 
The award is named in honor of a man who served as co-chairman at Pebble Beach for 27 years, Lauren Tryon. He was a leader, mentor, and friend of our event, and above all, dedicated his entire life to the collector car movement. Presenting the Lauren Tryon Trophy is Chairman Sandra Button. The 2018 Lauren Tryon Award goes to His Highness Rana Manvendra Singh Barwani from the Royal Family of Barwani in Madhya Pradesh, India. Manvendra Singh Barwani helped us get the cars from India for the Cars of the Maharaja feature in 2012, and also for this year's Motor Cars of the Raj. He's joined by his family, and he's had such an important impact on collector cars in his home country. India, of course, exploding, becoming one of the large markets in the world for new cars. Um, and, you know, India, Tata, the company Tata, of course, owns, now owns Jaguar Land Rover. So it's been a, a switch in fortunes, if you like. We now have uh, uh, an Indian company in charge of one of the world's great British brand names, Jaguar and Land Rover. We talk often about the passion of the people who find these cars and maintain them and restore them to such pristine shape. Well, earlier in the week, our Ella de Cadenet had the opportunity to speak with a couple of gentlemen about their cars, Jim Patterson and David Sidori. Their cars are both best of show contenders, both from the 1937 model year, but very different in many ways. The Cadillac that you're showing is an exceptional automobile built, I believe, for a young man in Switzerland. Yes, he wanted the biggest and baddest car that he could possibly get. It's designed by a fellow named Hartman, but Hartman was influenced by Fagoni Falashi, who did a lot of outstanding French designs. And also, the, if you look at the front of it, it has a little bit of Sauchik, which was a very famous bodybuilder at that time. David, you've been bringing consistently great cars to Pebble Beach for, what, over 20 years now? Yes. And this year, no exception, Alfa Romeo 2900B, Berlinetta. This is a very beautiful piece of automotive architecture built on a Grand Prix chassis with independent suspension all the way around, a transaxle, a wonderful eight-cylinder engine that has won many millimillions. It has two overhead cams, two superchargers, two carburetors, and it's the ultimate in engineering in the pre-war car, I think. It is the car that Alfa Romeo points to as the ultimate description of the Alfa Romeo mystique. Jim, what is your favorite thing about, in this particular period we're talking about, kind of early 1930s, mid-1930s? Well, you know, that was before the war, and a lot of uh, cars uh, were destroyed during the war. Some were hidden away, some were buried. Uh, in the 30s, it was a period where uh, style was very important. When you obtained this car and then decided that it needed to be treated to refreshment, shall we say, in your style, that's quite a, a stressful and, and it's something that requires a great deal of knowledge. Knowledge and commitment. And, and once you decide it's got to be done, everything needs to be done. And there were a couple of restorations here from the 80s where they used different levels of techniques, et cetera, that we needed to do. So we did everything in the car from top to bottom, every detail, and I think that shows today. I think these uh, gorgeous cars made a fantastic statement when they were new and we're very lucky that some of them still do perhaps even most of them still make a great statement today about how times were and many of the uh, collectors who've been before me have said it's fun to bring something back to life which we've done with this car we, we've actually brought it back to life Two fascinating cars, and I'll reiterate, both candidates for best of show in the minds of many people here. 
at Pebble Beach. Now currently on stage, second place car. Up next is the winner in the F2 class, Motor Cars of the Raj, 1931 Cadillac 452A Pininfarina Boattail Roadster. And this is one of 20 uh, chassis that were specifically built for export in 1931. Uh, V16 engine, wonderful, ordered by the 32-year-old Maharaja of Orcha through General Motors in Bombay. It was one of the first cars to be bodied by Battista Pininfarina, of course, who founded uh, Carrozzeria Pininfarina. So very, very historic bodywork on that car. This is the third place in Class G, Duesenberg's. It's a 1929 Duesenberg J Derham Sport Phaeton. And the Model J had debuted at the New York Motor Show on December 1, 1928. It was one of the most expensive cars ever launched in America. And in fact, on that day, they shut the New York Stock Exchange so the car could be revealed, presumably because all the brokers wouldn't be paying attention and be looking at uh, what they were going to be buying. Of course, the irony, the car was launched just before the Great Crash. Um, but a spectacular car, and the Duesenbergs, one of the absolute icons of American automotive tradition. No question about it. The original owner of the car was a member of the famous Vanderbilt family. Second in Class G for Duesenbergs, a 1935 J.N. Bowman and Schwartz convertible coupe. Great story behind this car. It, it originally had Ralston bodywork on it, um, but it was given to uh, Clark Gable by Carol Lombard, a glamour couple in the Hollywood era in the 1930s. And he had it restyled by Bowman and Schwartz to his own design. And Gable sketches, uh, sketched out what he wanted in the car. You can see the uh, single bar bumpers, lower windshield, the fender skirts, and the two covered spare tires at the rear. That, that's what Gable wanted on his car. And uh, of course, tragically, Carol Lombard was killed in an aircraft crash in 1942, and uh, Clark Gable reportedly never wanted to see that car again. But that is not the winner in the class for Duesenbergs. This car is a 1929 Duesenberg J. Murphy Town Limousine. And this was ordered by uh, a Captain George Whittle, who was born in San Francisco in 1881, and he was heir to one of the, the city's wealthiest family. In fact, his father was the founder of PG&E. And uh, upon his father's death in 1922, he received an inheritance of $29 million, which back then was an extraordinary amount of money. Um, he put it all in the stock market, and he pulled it all out weeks before the great crash. <laughs> he made, he had $50 million, and he's famous for, uh, among other things, purchasing 27 miles of Lake Tahoe shorefront and building the Thunderbird Lodge as his summer residence, which you can visit today um, as, as a tourist attraction. Just all sorts of marks on the culture. Fascinating story. Moving now to class J1 for European classic early, First car on stage will be the third place machine in class, a 1933 Delage D8S Freestone and Webb Coupe. And of course, we're in the happy hunting ground now for uh, Pebble Beach Best of uh, Show Contenders. Um, this car is interesting because it, it has an English body on it. Most uh, uh, Delages, of course, French built cars, had bodies by French coach builders. This one, uh, Freestone and Webb in London, and again, you can see by just looking at the car, the demeanor of the car, the gesture of the car, it has a very English feel to it, which actually makes it quite a unique Delage. You can tell the fans along the ramp are excited about it. A number of them have come to their feet to have a close look at this car. Delage uh, was uh, a race car company originally founded in 1905 by Louis Delage. And it was uh, acquired by Delahaye, another great mark that's well represented here at Pebble Beach in uh, 1935 and unfortunately uh, ceased operation in, in 1953. Uh, very sought after cars, uh, very powerful, uh, high technology. One of the great things about that body with its quite tall roof line is uh, it was designed so a gentleman could sit in it wearing his top hat. Very important. <laughs> that's very important, of course. You must have room for your top hat and is one of two surviving Delage D8s rolls away. Via 
weight the second place car in class. And that would be a 1932 Maybach DS8 Zeppelin Spohn Cabriolet, which draws a round of applause from people near the stage. Well, this is a bit of a surprise because this is owned by the Nethercut collection and uh, was widely regarded as being a, a real contender for best of show. But of course, as it's finished second, it's not eligible. And uh, Hermann Spohn was a German coach builder founded in 1920 in Ravensburg in Germany. And that was around about the same time that Dr. Karl Maybach had started building cars. Uh, Dr. Maybach was a technical director at Daimler in the early uh, part of the company's history and started building his own cars in about 1919, although he continued to build V12 uh, uh, Zeppelin engines. The Graf Zeppelin had Maybach engines on it and built engines for uh, railway carriages as well. Maybach's typically grand, big, powerful cars and very, very German, a very solid, muscular-looking car. And now here comes our winner in Class J1 for European Classic Early. A 1928 Minerva Type AF Hibbert and Darren transformable town car. And this is, uh, this is the upset that uh, lovely car, the Minerva and the AF, of course. Uh, Hibbert and Darren, uh, coach builders. Um, Although the car was coach built in Paris, of course, Darren came back, uh, American coach builder, came back and built cars uh, for uh, American customers here in America. Um, Minerva was established in, in 1897 and car production began in 1904. And uh, since from 1908, they used the night sleeve valve engine, which made them very smooth. Uh, and in fact, they thought seriously that they would compete with Rolls-Royce in Hispano Suiza. In fact, the list of customers included film stars and Maharajas, as well as the royal families of uh, Belgium, Sweden, and Norway. And it rolls off with the class win. This is J2 European Classic Mid, and uh, the third place car, 1935 Delage D8, with um, bodywork by Henri Chaperon. Another double winner. Stellage picking up the French Cup, awarded to the most significant car of French origin. And France is big this year. For the first time, the French Citroën brand has its own class here at Pebble Beach. This car was uh, delivered to its first owner, uh, a Dr. Imbert in Algiers. And in 1948, he commissioned a uh, another coach builder, Clabo, Robert Clabo, to uh, design more modern coach work for his car. So you can see by the look of this car, you know, the rounded, the rounded uh, grill at the front rather than a flat uh, uh, chromium bright grill. Um, it's been slightly updated from its original uh, look. And here comes the second place car in class. A 1937 Bugatti Type 57S Vandenplas Sports Tourer. What's interesting too is again the body on this car, Vandenplas body, uh, so an English body. The Type 57 uh, marked Jean Bugatti's uh, emergence as its uh, leader and creative director, following on from his father Ettore. And the 57S, the S stood for uh, Sebase or lowered. And uh, it was virtually a Grand Prix car in touring car guise. Uh, 3.2 litre straight eight engine with dry sump lubrication straight from uh, Grand Prix cars of the era. Uh, high compression pistons and a reinforced clutch. But the, the real difference between this car and the other type, the regular type 57s, and you could see it as it came on the ramp, is how low it rides to the road. Absolutely, it's strikingly low. And here is the class winner for European Classic Mid-Year, a 1936 Mercedes-Benz 540K Cabriolet A. 540K was a 5.4 litre straight eight engine with a supercharger, uh, followed on from the 500K, uh, very big, powerful German cars. Um, 
And this one, uh, the Cabriolet A, was built in uh, Mercedes' own Sindelfingen coachworks. The Sindelfingen factory is still there, it still builds Mercedes-Benz cars. I was fortunate enough earlier this week to drive the car that preceded this, the 500K, in a roadster body, and I've got to tell you, it was the most amazing experience. <laughs> that car is on the lawn here at, uh, at Pebble Beach, a uh, $15 million car, and I can tell you, we look at these cars driving up on the ramps, they're not that easy to drive. Uh, no synchromesh in the gearboxes. Really? Uh, you've got to be careful with the clutch and, and the e-brake to get it up and on the ramp smoothly. So while you might not think it's much getting the car up onto the ramp, it actually requires a bit more work, particularly the older cars. This is the 1938 Bugatti Type 57C Latonia a Marchand three-position cabriolet. Striking colour scheme on that car. I should say. Green over green. With a hat to match, I do detect. The Parisian uh, coach building company, Latonio Marchand, was founded in 1905 by uh, two coach builders. And uh, although most of their work appeared on Delages, uh, they did do other cars, most notably this Bugatti here. Up next, second place car, a 1939 Lagonda V12 Le Mans Rapide Drophead Coupe. And um, in 1935, uh, Alan P. Good, who became the new owner of Lagonda, recruited a certain W.O. Bentley, you may have heard of him. Um, and W.O. and his team designed an entirely new model, the Lagonda V12, which was built between 1937 and 1940 and is considered one of the finest V12 engine cars of the pre-war era. And uh, it, it featured some quite modern touches, independent torsion bar front suspension, modern hydraulic drum brakes. 17 of the sportier Rapides were built on the shorter 124-inch wheelbase and fitted with one of eight Le Mans specification engines, which had four rather than two carburetors. So yeah. not only did it look good, it went quickly. The engine breathes a lot easier, and the car performs better. The car all the way from Hong Kong, by the way. Well-known collector, Sir Michael Kaduri. Also a double winner of the Elegance in Motion trophy. Now here's the 1939 Lagonda V12 Rapide James Young Drophead Coupe, the winner in European Classic Late. And uh, another Lagonda V12 Rapide and um, the fabulous engine and, uh, and demeanor of the car. And this car, um, was uh, remained in England until 1957 when with only 10,000 miles up it was exported to Australia and so uh, the car was uh, used sparingly until 2015 and then sympathetically refurbished in England and uh, still has less than 32,000 miles on the clock. Staggering. From Allen Tribe in Mosman Park, Australia. Moving on now to class J4, Italian classics, a 1932 Lancia di Lambda Viotti Torpedo is third in class. And there, were, there are seven cars in this class. In fact, there were so many great Italian cars this year, the organizers felt they needed, rather than put them in with the, the European um, early, mid, and, and late, um, gave them their own class. And uh, this, is a, this is a terrific car. Uh, Lancia di Lambda, uh, Vincenzo Lancia, one of the world's great automotive engineers, really visionary guy. Um, the Lancia Lambda that he uh, also produced was the world's first monocoque construction car. He also produced the first production car with a narrow V, V4 engine. A very innovative engineer. And the Di Lambda was his attempt to get into the luxury market, really move Lancia brand um, upscale. Of course, Lancia still exists today. It's part of FCA. It's really a brand that only appears in Italy these days, um, but it is still around. It's still part of the automotive fabric, automotive landscape. Believed to be the only surviving example of the De Lambda model from that year. Second in class for Italian classics, 
This 1928 Alfa Romeo 6C 1500S WC and RC Atcherley open sports car. Fantastic car, this, and Alfa Romeo was at the cutting edge of automotive uh, performance engineering in the 1920s and 30s. And this car actually had Grand Prix racing technology in a road car, one of the first Italian sports cars to do that. It was called the Alfa Romeo Normale when it was first advertised. Uh, it was renamed the 6C1500 when it aroused uh, great interest. Uh, it was fitted with Alfa's 1.5 litre straight six engine, and was, which was based on the straight eight engine used in the P2 Grand Prix car. Uh, there were three versions. You could have the single overhead camshaft Normale, this car, or the twin overhead uh, camshaft Sport, or the supercharged Super Sport. car was originally raced in the Shelsley Walsh Hill Climb in 1929. I believe that is the oldest surviving motorsports competition in the world. Shelsley Walsh. You are correct. The Hill it Climb was held happens. earlier this year. And now our class winner and yet another double winner picking up the Charles A. Chain Trophy to the car with the most advanced engineering of its era. This is a 1937 Alfa Romeo 8C 2900B Touring Berlinetta. And this is a real contender for best of show. This car, absolutely fabulous. Staggering uh, uh, technology under the hood. Uh, this was a cutting edge, almost a supercar of the pre-war era in terms of its performance and its technology. But on top of that, it had this beautiful bodywork, super legera coachwork around it. Ultra long hood, cabin set right back on the wheelbase, a very streamlined, aerodynamic, modern looking car. It was first restored during the 1990s and won the most elegant uh, uh, closed car here at Pebble a few years later. But its current owner has restored it back to 1938 Berlin Motor Show specification. And this is the first time the finished car has been seen anywhere in the world. And it picks up first in class, making it eligible for a best of show. That's quite a record. Already think, having picked up another special award. Yeah, I think this car is a, is a real contender. It, it's, it's very Pebble Beach car and just look at how elegant it looks when it mm. moves. A truly beautiful thing. That color is actually dark blue. It looks black, but it's dark blue, very dark blue. Well, we're about halfway through our various class high scorers, half of the field for our best of show contenders, and some of the specific awards have been picked up as well. I have to agree with what you said earlier, Angus, that this really is one of the better years for the Pebble Beach Conquerors. And Hats off to the selection committee who worked such long hours to go through all of the hundreds of entries to pick the 200 plus cars that appear on the show field behind us. It constantly amazes me that they managed to find cars of these, this quality, um, the cars that have uh, the, the technical uh, features or the, the unique coach work or the cars with simply a fabulous story to tell. Um, you, you, there's a finite number of these things, yet somehow sure. yes. new cars keep coming out of the woodwork every year and the very, very best of them come here because this is the concours that they all want to win. It's a very competitive spirit among those serious restorers and collectors. Finishing in third place is a 1929 Rolls-Royce Phantom 1 Brewster York Roadster from John and Heather Mozart of Palo Alto, California. In order to keep the show moving, you send a class when you have it. Sometimes that takes us out of our takes us out of our predetermined order, but that's just fine. We're going to see all the cars, and that's what we came here for. In second place, a 1928 Rolls-Royce Phantom 1 Barker Dual Cal Phaeton from Irving Jensen III in Dakota Dunes, South Dakota. Interesting history to this car. The, uh, it was known as the Duchess, and uh, it was designed for continental touring by its first owner, Sir John Harmsworth who owned the London Daily Mail newspaper and whose um, uh, descendants still do. Um, Sir John Harmsworth also founded Perrier Sparkling Water Company. And this car was ordered as an exact replica of the Phantom One owned by his brother, Lord Rothermere. And uh, it, that car, the, his brother's car, later appeared in the film Supergirl starring Faye Dunaway. 
something wonderful about a Rolls Royce. Uh, they just have a gravitas to them, um, an elegance to them, and they're a very imposing car. I mean, the spirit of ecstasy on that grill, standing proud there, uh, the massive uh, Parthenon grill, absolutely recognizable worldwide as a Rolls Royce grill, inspired by the proportions of an ancient Greek temple. A 1938 Rolls Royce Phantom III, James Young Drophead Coupe, all the way from China. The winner in Class H for Rolls Royce pre war. And the Phantom III had a 7.3 litre V12 engine. And what's interesting about this car, it has a new front suspension design that uh, was borrowed from General Motors. So, you know, American automotive engineering technology was right at the top of its game in the 1930s and in fact so impressive that Rolls-Royce went to General Motors to get a front suspension design for its premium luxury car. Of course Rolls-Royce is a company that's been in the luxury car business since 1904 and only last year launched its eighth generation Phantom, a car I've driven and is absolutely amazing to drive. Smoothest, quietest car I have ever driven. The 2018 Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance live stream is brought to you by Haggerty, for people who love cars. By Jaguar, the art of performance. Back at Pebble Beach Golf Links and the 68th Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance. We await our next class rolling up. It looks like class L1 pre-war preservation because you can tell these cars aren't all that shiny but uh, the preservation class is one of my personal favorites and a real crowd pleaser. This particular car, a Stevens Durea C6 from 1913, is totally unrestored. It was cared for by its first owner until 1946 and its next owner only put routine maintenance on the car so it, it's Despite its incredible state of preservation, it's actually used quite regularly and uh, driven around Vermont. Um, it's amazing to see a car that hasn't been restored. It has just been used like its designers intended. And it's 105 years old. 105. I hope I'm in that good shape when I'm 105. <laughs> We expect pre-war, I mean, preservation class cars to be perhaps from the 40s and 50s. 1913, and still essentially the way it was born. And it's used, you know, and I love that. I love people yes. that, that use cars. Um, I'm not one for uh, sitting there looking at them. I'd like to get in and drive them. Right. No trailer queens. That's the third place car. The second place car is up there now, a 1910. Regal Model N underslung Fisher Roadster. Well, you talked about the last car being uh, unrestored since 1913. This one goes back to 1910. Absolutely amazing car. It's in original working condition. The Regal Car Company was founded in Detroit in 1907 to build medium size and medium price cars. And um, this Regal underslung was delivered to its first owner in Hartford, Connecticut where it stayed until the 1970s. Uh, the amazing car, it's, it, many details remain untouched, including its body panels. It has its original leather straps. The tufted upholstery is, is original. And all the correct instruments and lamps, they're the sorts of things that disappear and restorers hunt high and low to try and find these parts to give the car, make sure their car is original. But this car, they've never left. It's been there since day one. Incredible car. Meaning the body is hung essentially below the frame rails rather than placed on top of them. And the, the axles and the springs are uh, underneath as well. The springs right. look like they're reversed. And any engineer will tell you, you want to get the weight down low for better handling and balance. Here's the winner in the Class L1 pre-war preservation. Also a double winner picking up the Mercedes-Benz Star of Excellence Award presented to the most significant Mercedes-Benz present. A 1929 Mercedes-Benz 710 SS Barker Tourer race car. And there's a, a bold prediction. I'm not sure that it will happen, but if there is ever a preservation car with a chance of winning best of show, it's this car. This car has an incredible history. The uh, SS was a super sport. Um, it had uh, 
200 horsepower with its supercharger engaged. But this particular car was built for Rudolf Caracciola, one of the greatest racing drivers of all time. And uh, he drove it in the 1929 Ulster Tourist Trophy. And then he went not only winning that race, he then drove it in the 1930 Irish Grand Prix, the 1931 German Grand Prix, and the 1931 Mille Miglia. And this car is unrestored. It was owned by the Earl Howe, who raced it in the United Kingdom and uh, kept it in his garage for many, many years. It's an extraordinary piece of automotive history. This Mercedes-Benz is a car that I had in my garage about 40 years ago. I was dying to buy it. I thought I'd lock it up so the owner couldn't sell it to anybody else. Knocked on my door one day and said, Alan, give us the car. Had to give it back. It's a phenomenal car. I mean, it's one of the most successful pre-war racing cars of all time with Rudolf Caracciola in there. Won the 1931 TT and the 1931 Millimilia. That was the first time a non-Italian car ever won the Millimilia. And only Mercedes-Benz won it twice, 1955 with Sterling Moss and 1931 with Rudolf Caracciola. This is a seriously important car, absolutely delicious. All right, thanks very much, Alan. Great story. And now we're hearing our third place car in Class L2 for post-war preservation was unable to start. That means it will not appear on stage to receive its award. So we will move on to the second place car in class. A 1954 Studebaker Commander Starliner Coupe. No, I think I, I think, think he, so. I think he might have got the Oscar started. That ah, looks that's like what it, it is. Or, or else it's a very small Studebaker. <laughs> right. <laughs> now you're absolutely right. And I'm glad that the owner Roger Hoffman was able to get that car because it's another double winner picking up the FIVA post-war trophy for the best preserved post-war car as determined by a special judging committee guided by the organization's regulations. I'm so glad he got it started. I mean, imagine coming to Pebble Beach, uh, placing in your class, and then not getting a trophy because your car couldn't make it up onto the ramp. Absolutely. It'd be heartbreaking. But this car still has its original Oxblood leather interior, its original Nardi steering wheel with a hand-painted Oscar badge, as well as the car's original three-piece fitted Swiss luggage. And of course, Oscar's one of the featured marks here at uh, Pebble Beach this year. And we're going to see a lot more Oscar racing cars uh, later on in today. Roll smartly off the ramp, out through the crowd. Here's the second place car in post-war preservation, the 1954 Studebaker Commander Starliner Coupe that I mentioned earlier. A fabulous piece of design, a Raymond Lowy classic, this car. I mean, back in the era, Studebakers prior to this kind of looked a bit dumpy and frumpy. This just looks amazing, low slung, almost European. Uh, it's got a relatively old fashioned V8 under the hood, but that didn't matter at the time. What's interesting about this car, the owner, uh, William Babich of East Pittsburgh, purchased it and he kept it for 60 years. And in fact, he was so fastidious about the car that only his wife and his niece Linda were allowed in the car and they could not wear any clothing with buttons or zippers for fear of scratching the paint. <laughs> so he, he put just 6,683 miles on the car between 1954 and 1959 and only ever drove it during the summer. And in 1960, he stopped driving the car altogether, but he would start it once a month and drive it once a year to have it inspected. So it really is a time warp. And it's, since 1963, this car has only done eight miles. Although I did see it on the Tour d'Elegance, so it might have done a few more than that. Yeah. But an absolute time warp car. Fantastic. Well, it comes in second in class. Its current owner, by the way, Wayne Carini, well-known television car finder and restorer. Now it's time for the winner in class. Look at this beautiful 1970 Ferrari 246 GT Dino Scaglietti two-door coupe. It's one of the few cars I've actually uh, also driven on, on the lawn, but not, not this particular car. Uh, I've driven a 246 Dino. Dino, of course, was meant to be the baby Ferrari and named after Enzo's son, Dino Ferrari, sadly, uh, who sadly died young. Um, 
beautiful little car. If you can imagine a Mazda Miata done by Ferrari, this is the sort of car it is. It, it, it's a little V6 engine. You drove it with your fingers and toes. Such delicacy and immediacy through the steering and the chassis. And, and of course, it looks beautiful. It's, it's almost the perfect mid-engine, mid-60s sports car. Fabulous cars. Easy to pick out because the badging does not say Ferrari with the prancing horse. It says Dino. Let's hear once again from Alan de Cadenet. These Ferrari Scaglietti specials are absolutely delightful cars. This grey one coming across now, for instance, it's built on a short wheelbase Ferrari that we're more used to seeing with a Berlinetta body. Kind of car that Sterling Moss raced at Goodwood and won the 1960 TT. And then you had another one and came back and won the 1961 TT. But when you see a Scaglietti bodied car like that, I'm told there are about something like 36 of them in total made. I don't know how many have survived, but this one is a total beauty. And I'm so pleased to see it here at Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance. That's the kind of car that has every right and deserves to be here. It is a 1958 Ferrari 250 GT long wheelbase Scaglietti Spider California. And I might be the heretic here, but I have a thing about Ferraris that are not red. I love them. I love non-red Ferraris, and the color on this car is fantastic. A lovely soft gray. One of 50 Series 1 cars built. This, the 11th Spider California built in 1958. And you're right, it is a beautiful car in that color. Second place in Ferrari Grand Touring Class, the 1962 Ferrari 250 GT short wheelbase Scaglietti Spider California. Yeah, the Spider California was introduced in 1960, built on an 18 shorter competition chassis from the 250 GT short wheelbase race car. You really have to be across your wheelbases and your uh, definitions with these Ferraris. The V12 engine was upgraded to the semi-competition Tipo 168 specification and to increase, to cope with the increase in power, it was fitted with Dunlop disc brakes. This particular car was driven for a short time by Bob Hope while he was touring in Europe with the USA. That is provenance. And the winner in class for Ferrari Grand Touring Machines, this 1957 Ferrari 250 GT Pininfarina Cabriolet Series 1. And this particular car was once thought to have been ordered by the Woolworth heiress Barbara Hutton for her fifth husband. Porfiro Ruberosa. Except one problem with the story is that uh, when he took delivery of the car, they'd already been divorced. But it is generally agreed he did own the car. How he got to uh, obtain it is, is a mystery at this point. Um, he was the first owner of the car, and uh, this car is one of 39 Series 1 Cabriolets. Ferrari 250. GT Testarossa. These, this is one of the all-time great racing cars that Ferrari produced for long-distance events. Sebring 12 hours, Le Mans 24 hours. I had one of these a long, long time ago. You could buy them for nothing in the 1960s, literally nothing. Drive it round the street, go and do some vintage racing with it, and then you had to try and sell it before it started smoking too badly because you couldn't afford to actually get it repaired. Now on stage, a 53 Ferrari 250 MM Pininfarina Coupe, the third place car in class. This car was uh, built primarily to compete in long distance races, such as the Million Million, the Carrera Panamericana, as well as the 24 hour Le Mans. And it, uh, it has a 2.9 litre, 240 horsepower V12 engine. And this particular car was raced in the 1953 Million Million. 1958 Ferrari 250 Testarossa Scaglietti Spider is now on stage, second place. Of course, the Testa, 
Testarossa gets its name from the fact that the cylinder heads on the engine were painted red. Rosso. And um, Italian is such a wonderful language that something as uh, mundane as red head could sound so racy and spectacular. Testarossa. This particular, uh, this particular car was shipped to John von Neumann in California, a uh, famous Ferrari dealer in California. And uh, the car was raced in uh, Arizona and California in the 19, 1960 season. Fantastic car, the Testarossa, great history with them, um, and certainly one of the great uh, Ferrari sports cars, a really dramatic looking body, the way the, the fenders are cut away uh, behind the front wheels and the exhaust pipes come out and the four pipes at the rear of the car. Um, it's almost the schoolboy definition of a 1950s racing Ferrari sports car. Certainly one of the best known Ferrari silhouettes. Reported by Ferrari's man on the West Coast here in California, John Van Neumann. But here comes the winning car in class. This is a 1955 Ferrari 500 Mondial Scaglietti Spider. What's interesting about the Mondial, 500 Mondial, is it has a four-cylinder engine. Everyone thinks of Ferraris with, mm -hmm. with you know, V12s and, uh, and V8s. This is a four-cylinder. And, um, and it's running. And it's running. <laughs> Thank goodness. In this, uh, at its first race, the 12 hours of Casablanca, which sounds uh, just so romantic. Yes. Uh, factory drivers Alberto Ascari and Gigi Villoresi finished first in class and went on to help win Ferrari's second sports car world championship in 1954. This car was often raced in uh, Scandinavia, spent a long time racing in Scandinavia uh, on spiked tires, of course, you know, on the frozen lakes. Must have been quite interesting to drive. I wonder how it survived. This car has actually competed in 17 Milli Milli retrospectives and uh, I was fortunate enough to have driven in one of those. Uh, the most amazing event you drive, uh, classic period sports cars from the 1920s through the 1950s, following the route of the Milli Milli, the thousand mile road race uh, from Brescia down to Rome and back through the heart of Italy. And uh, I drove in a 1954 Alfa Romeo Sportiva but it was amazing to see cars like this yep. on the road. Sometimes they'd go past you, exhaust pipes Sing. blaring, spitting fire, and you'd dream you were back in the Milli Media in the good old days. <laughs> I hope you love your job as much as I do. <laughs> Once again, here's Alan. In 1937, Maserati brothers had to sell their Maserati company, weren't allowed to make another car for 10 years. 1947, they founded the Oscar Company, that's the Office for Special Production Automobiles, Oscar, or Special Construction, I should say. This is a beautiful little car. It's a 1954 Oscar 2000 S. Instead of having a four-cylinder engine, it's got a six-cylinder engine, but this is the only one they made with a two-and-a-half-liter engine. It's got a transaxle and a Dion suspension, Sterling Moss reckoned these were amongst the very best handling cars that he ever, ever won. We've got one right here. Delicious thing to see. Thanks, Alan. It'll be on stage in a moment. Here is our third place car in Class N1 for Oscar pre-1955. A 52 Oscar MT4 prototype through a Spider. And as Alan said, uh, Oscar was founded by the Maserati brothers so they could get back into car racing. And Oscars are characterized, they, they were small cars, four-cylinder cars mostly, but they had a reputation for great handling and being uh, extremely competitive in uh, small sports car racing. And in fact, that car raced three times in the road races that were a part of the original Pebble Beach celebration in 1954, Pebble Beach Cup. Second place car in class, the one Alan was just referring to, the 1954 Oscar 2000 S Frua Spider. And this is one of the uh, few Oscars with a six cylinder engine, albeit a two litre six cylinder engine, which was um, built from or built for Oscar's Formula 2 race cars. So they detuned it slightly and uh, put it into a sports car body. This car has raced extensively in Italy, including the Giro de Sicilia and the Milli Milia. Again, uh, after that it was brought uh, to the USA and it was raced by Jim Hall, a very famous name in American racing. Absolutely. Of course, the man who went on to build the, the Chaparral race cars. That's right. 
And this car is another double winner, picking up the Phil Hill Cup, named for a great participant of both the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance and the Pebble Beach Road Races, awarded to a significant race car and a deserving winner. It's a sweet little car, that one. It just looks looks bigger than it really is. Mm -hmm. And now here comes the class winner for pre-1955 Oscars, a 49 Oscar MT4 Siluro. And Siluro, torpedo in Italian. And uh, it has a 1,092cc overhead camshaft four engine. But look just how tiny this car is. Um, of course, back in those days, in the in the late 1940s, early 1950s, no such thing as uh, roll cages and uh, seat belts. Uh, in fact, the drivers of the day used to say it was better to be thrown right. from the car. And you look how, <laughs> just look how small that car is. It's tiny. Mm -hmm. And it comes to the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance from Israel, one of 17 different countries with representatives here at the 68th edition. Congratulations to the class winner for pre-1955 Oscars. And now class N2 is for Oscars from 1955 to 1960. In third place is a 1956 MT4 TN Morelli Spider. And one of the reasons they've broken the Oscars up uh, between uh, pre-1955 and uh, 1955 to 1960 is that Pre-1955, there weren't many coach builders near Bologna, which is where the uh, Maserati brothers uh, had their factory. Um, Morelli was in nearby Ferrara and rebodied a car in 1953. And from about 1955 on, um, Oscar bodies were about 90% of Morelli's business. And uh, this car was driven by Carol Shelby and gentleman Jim Kimberley, who rode it, drove it in the 1957, 56 Road America race, and the car finished in first place. And in 1956, Nassau Speed Week was driven by a departed friend of ours, the wonderful Denise McCluggage. Yes, indeed. Second place car in class is a 1960 Oscar 750S Morelli Sports Racer. And the 750 uh, number actually is the capacity of the engine. Tiny little car, 750cc racing was actually very popular uh, in the 1950s and 60s. Sterling Moss cut his teeth racing 750cc powered cars. And while that might not sound too impressive, but uh, the cars, as you can see, very, very light, very small, and then very fast. Max Sterling Moss won the Sebring 12 hours in an Oscar. And that particular car there raced three times at Sebring. One of the toughest endurance races on the planet. First in Class N2 for Oscars from 1955 to 1960, a 1955 MT4 1500 Morelli Spider. This car had a, a more rare streamlined Morelli body that was built for an American racer Paul Papalato, and uh, all the 78 MT4 chassis built, Morelli had bodies on about 25 of them. Uh, this car was shown at Pebble Beach in 1996 and has since been restored for its return visit. And uh, a good job, obviously, good enough to win best in class, which puts it in contention for best of show. And now back to the staging area and Alan. 1957 BMW 507, got a V8 two liter engine in it. This car's had a full restoration. It's immaculate. They only built 252 of these cars when they were new. How many survived today? I've no idea, but this one is an absolute beauty. The only other one of these I ever drove in was a car that John Surtees, the ex Formula One, uh, Grand Prix driver who was also a motorcycle Grand Prix winner he was given one by BMW and he never sold it he died earlier this year 
Maybe his car become available. I don't know, but this is a total beauty. And now on the grid, uh, we've got the 1950 Talbot Lago T26 Grand Sport Pennock Coupe, third in class 01 post-war touring. And Talbot Lago, uh, built between 1948 and 1953, the T26 had a six-cylinder engine. It was the last of Talbot's great coach build cars. Anthony, uh, um, Anthony Lago, of course, wealthy businessman, wanted to get into Grand Prix racing and also build uh, expensive sports cars for the road. So the BMW 507, uh, this is uh, second in 01 post-war touring. One of the great sports cars. It was inspired by uh, BMW's New York importer, Max Hoffman. And the mechanicals come from the BMW 502 and 503 sedans and coupes. It uses a 3.2 litre V8 engine. A little piece of trivia here. There is a connection between this car and the Datsun 240Z. They're in fact designed by the same person, Albrecht von Goertz, who was a protege of Raymond Lowy. Unfortunately for BMW, they lost money on every 507 they built. So after just building 252, production was abandoned in late 1959. And to the winning car in the class, 01 for post-war touring, a 1948 Talbot Lago T26 Grand Sport Figoni Fastback Coupe. Yes, another T26. And you might notice that detail above the center headlight. This car was owned by its original owner, Mr. Faioli, was known as the Zipper King. And for this reason, there's a string of horizontal chrome strips above the center headlight. It's the only car in the world you'll ever see with a zipper on the hood. Fantastic car, really distinctive car. We followed this car, or I followed this car on the Tour d'Elegance, and um, I can tell you the owner wasn't hanging around. It might be a class winner here at Pebble Beach, but it was certainly driven with some verve and vigor on the road during the Tour d'Elegance. Let's continue with the class 02 for post-war Grand Touring. Third in class, this 1956 Cadillac Hessen Eisenhardt presidential parade car. I'm a bit puzzled by the definition of a Grand Tourer here because uh, <laughs> we mostly think of GTs as being sporty cars, the elegant, fast coachwork. This thing, it's massive. It's a uh, a presidential parade car that was used by uh, President Eisenhower, Kennedy and Johnson. Uh, of course, the car has an extended wheelbase, it has lots of room, it has, and you'll see the running boards on the sides and at the rear, two areas where, of course, the Secret Service agents and the handles on, on the trunk, as you see the car go past us, where the Secret Service agents used to hang on. and. Uh, keep their eyes, watchful eyes, on the crowd. It's a massive car. He can barely get it around the corner as he drives off the ramp. Certainly with all the armor plating, powerful radio transmitter, and steel wheel protection. It is quite a load. And it is third in the class for post-war Grand Touring, finishing second, a 1957 Bentley S1 Continental Park Ward Drophead Coupe. The Bentley S1 Continental is one of the most beautiful of the big uh, Bentley two-door cars. And H.J. Um, Mulliner, Hooper and James Young all built open and closed bodies. But this drop head is one of just 31 built by Park Ward. Lovely uh, two-tone color scheme that these cars wear so well. Um, and it was delivered in 1956 to Frederick Brewster of Connecticut and he was connected to the famous Brewster coach building firm, the coach builder who built the body for the car that won last year. And here is our first place car in post-war Grand Touring, a 1949 Delahaye 135M Partout Malmaison Cabriolet. Yeah, the Delahaye 135, known as the Coupe, de, Coupe des Alpes after the success in the Alpine Rally, was first shown at the Paris show in 1935. 
and the production continued until 1954. This one is the work of Marcel Poutou, one of France's best known coach builders. And the uh, body design was named the Malmaison after the Chateau de Malmaison in rural Malmaison near Paris. It's got a, uh, a Type 103S engine with triple Solex carburetors. And there are fewer than six examples of this cabriolet style were made, and only three are known to exist today. That's your winner in post-war Grand Touring. And once again, we have Alan. Everybody knows about Ford's 1-2-3 in the 1966 Le Mans race. This is the fourth team car. It was being driven by Dan Gurney. He's well in the lead in the 18th hour. He's going to win it, likely. And the darn head gasket blew. However, they've resurrected the car completely. And in great tribute to that wonderful, wonderful man, Dan Gurney, here it is at Pebble Beach. I think Dan Gurney, probably one of the, well, one of the most popular racing drivers of all time. Absolutely, totally delightful man. That's his car. Thank you, Alan, indeed. We lost Dan Gurney, but his presence is very much felt both here at the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance, among the teams, drivers, and cars over at WeatherTech Raceway for the Rolex Monterey Motorsports reunion and all over. Just leaving the ramp now is third in 03 post-war sports, the 1952 Porsche Type 540. And uh, this was Porsche's first production race car, created at the behest of UM's importer Max Hoffman. There's that name again, associated with the BMW 507. Second place in post-war sports class, a 1955 Maserati A6 GCS Frua Spider. So the first Maserati six-cylinder engine car, the A6, went from 1,500cc to 2 litres and was given the name A6G. But in 1953, the engine was updated and tuned by Giacchino Colombo, who worked on Ferrari engines, and that resulted in the more powerful 170 horsepower A6 GCS where the CS stood for Corsa Sport, racing sport. Just 52 of the AG A6 GCS 53 were built and 48 were open spiders like this car, which was bodied by Carrozzeria Frua. That car is also a double winner, picking up the Briggs Cunningham Trophy, awarded to the most exciting open car on hand, named, of course, for the great American sportsman racer and car builder, Briggs Cunningham. And here is our winner in the class for post-war sports, the car Alan was referring to, the ex Dan Gurney 1966 Ford GT40 Mark IIB Coupe. And of course that car, uh, although it didn't, uh, it didn't win in, uh, but took part in the famous clash with uh, Ferrari and Ford at Le Mans in 1966. And uh, it was widely regarded as uh, um, Henry Ford II's revenge for Enzo Ferrari turning down a deal in 1963 for Ford Motor Company to buy Ferrari. Uh, apparently Enzo got cold feet at the very last minute and uh, Henry decided to go racing and beat Enzo where it hurt most, at Le Mans. And the GT40, Absolutely iconic racing car. There is, of course, now a new Ford GT on the road, a sports car that also has raced at Le Mans. I've driven the new GT40. It is the nearest thing to a race car you can drive on the road. And, of course, there is a movie being made about the Ford-Ferrari battles at Le Mans. And here's a hint. Look for the character of Dan Gurney as portrayed by his son, Alex Gurney. The movie is in production now. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and we'll be back with more from the 68th Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance. Isn't it time you connected to something greater? Sometimes the best way to connect is to disconnect. This moment of escape was brought to you by Haggerty for people who love cars.
We are back at the Pebble Beach Golf Links and the 68th Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance. I'm Bob Varsha with Angus McKenzie, Ed Lowe, Johnny Lebrun, and Alan Decadene. We are on to Class P, another new class this year for Eisenhower-era Dream Convertibles. And how about this, a 1953 Oldsmobile Fiesta convertible. And that's uh, our third place car in the class. Here's our second place car, a 1953 Packard Caribbean convertible. These Eisenhower era dream convertibles, it really was a, a renaissance of the, the gilded age of American automobiles. Each one of these cars was a special built car built by the factory that cost considerably more than regular versions. So. 50 Caribbeans were built in 1953, and each one sold for $5,210, which was a premium of nearly $2,000 over a regular standard Packard convertible. Many of the styling cues for the Caribbean came from earlier 1950s Packard show cars, such as the Packard Pan American. And in fact, the, the way they built this car, it was took a standard Packard convertible and was sent off to the specialty coachworks of Mitchell Bentley of Ionia, Michigan for all the various modifications. Special wheel cutouts, modified chrome side trim and chrome wired wheels as well as a steel covered continental style sport uh, uh, spare wheel kit for the back of the car. Well, the Eisenhower era was noted by all of the optimism in America about all that could be done, the opulence, live for today, buy the biggest, shiniest car you could find, and here <laughs> comes the paradigm of that concept. The winner in Class P for Eisenhower era Dream Convertibles, a 1959 Cadillac Eldorado Biarritz Convertible. And I think this was the car in which Detroit reached peak tail fin. Absolutely extraordinary piece of uh, stamping, metalwork, and engineering designed, of course, under the auspices of the legendary Harley Earl. And these cars really, really typified the optimism of 1950s America. And I'm reminded, it was Chris Bangle, the BMW designer, who once told me, he said, you know, when these cars were designed, car designers believed that cars would one day fly and you've only got to look at the tail fins on this thing and the, the, the openings in the bumper which are like the, the intakes for a, a jet engine. This car looks like something from the rocket age. That's absolutely amazing. Weighing a swell 5,060 pounds and it had a price tag of $7,401 which was nearly $2,000 more than a standard Series 62 Cadillac. And uh, they sold about 1,320 Beeritz versions, which had everything, air conditioning, bucket seats, cruise control, which was quite innovative in 1959. Do the math, that's about a dollar and a quarter a pound, I think. <laughs> Cheap at half the price. Let's move on now to class Q for post-war custom Citroen. Another debut class here. The first time Citroen has been so honored here the world's greatest Concorde d'Elegance. This is a 1967 Citroen DS21 Cabriolet d'Usine. Third place. The Citroen DS is one of my favorite all-time automobiles. When it appeared at the 1955 Paris show, its rocket ship shape, its hydro-pneumatic suspension, it was the most advanced production car compared with its competitors ever launched. Convertible versions were built uh, at the factory and with Henri Chaperon, and they were expensive. It cost twice as much as a normal DS, but such a striking car. Absolutely. Hydro-pneumatic suspension. I've done a lot of miles in DS Citroens over the years. They're the most amazing car to ride. The ride is like being in an armchair, like no other car you'll ever drive. Once you've seen one, you will remember it. That's the third place car in class. In second place, this 1965 Citroën DS Majesty Chaperon Limousine. Well, Henri Chaperon um, 
enjoyed a bit of a renaissance in the 1950s and 60s with Citroen. He was a coach builder that started in 1919. He did a lot of pre-war cars, noticeably, notably uh, Delages, um, and as well some Bugattis. But with Citroen and doing these special body cars, he really had a renaissance. And this, this is quite extraordinary, this very formal roofline on the swoopy DS21. It's quite an extraordinary looking car, has a real presence to it. And here comes the class winner in post-war custom Citroën, a 1966 DS21 Chaperon Le Leman Coupe. And I love this car, the, uh, the thinness of the pillars. You know, the problem today, we, we rollover regulations, you can never have pillars that thin. The light, airy glass house on this car, it's almost like it doesn't have a roof at all, but it does have this magnificent, elegant, formal roof line. There were 27 of these two-door L'Element Coupés built. And, you know, Chaperon uh, continued working on Citroën cars after the DS finished and into the subsequent CX uh, range of Citroëns and uh, SM range of Citroëns. And some of those cars are here on, on the lawn, part of the eight cars in this special class. One of the highlights, I think, of Pebble Beach this year. I agree. And now it's time for another special class for Scarab race cars. The creations of Lance Reventlow. And the Scarabs, of course, uh, a unique American racing car. Um, and Lance Reventlow was um, heir to the Woolworth fortune. <laughs> Well, while we have a moment, we talked earlier about the preservation class. Cars basically untouched from the day they were born. Well, earlier we sat down with Brian Pollock, who is both a judge and an entrant here at the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance to talk about his post-war preservation class 1967 Ferrari Dino to learn why it remains untouched from birth. And his answer may surprise you. My mom told me that the first word out of my mouth was cars, and that's what started my enjoyment and quest for all types of different cars. I was watching Velocity and their program about Pebble Beach done through Motor Trend, and I want to quote from Jay Leno. He said on the program, this is from the 2017 Pebble Beach Concours, I'd, like I'd like to find the Ferrari owner the with the first wife. wife. That, that would be, be interesting. interesting. Well. I happen to be that maybe possibly the one and only Ferrari owner that has the first wife and she's been very understanding and she is a car person so she really really enjoys all these car events and at times she enjoys them more than I do. The car that we're uh, taking to Pebble Beach this year is a 1970 Ferrari Dino and my wife and I we use it on our honeymoon we spent three months driving around in Europe so the only reason that the car is preserved is because I'm a big procrastinator. My favorite expression is I haven't started to procrastinate. Over the years I've wanted to paint it red, but I never got around to doing it. And then at one point what I wanted to do is restore it, but being a procrastinator again, I never got around to it. And then one day a friend of mine said, you can't restore this car, it's too original, leave it the way it is. And so that's how we ended up having a car that's gonna be eligible for the preservation class. And now that the car is preserved and I'm a little bit older, I think that preservation is the coolest thing going because I have a bit of patina on me and the car has some patina. So we kind of go together better than uh, if it was all fresh and shiny and I was still patinaed. So this year I'm a judge in the pre-war European class is called J-Class. One of the things that differentiates Pebble Beach judging from a lot of the other concours is that authenticity is one of the primary things that we're judging. Because once they have the Pebble Beach stamp of approval on it, that's, that's part of their pedigree, and we don't want to screw things up and say something is something when it's not. We've been going to Pebble Beach many, many years. This will be the 30th year that I've been a judge at Pebble Beach, but this is the first time we're doing the Pebble Beach Motoring Classic. And from what I understand, we're getting to get a good use out of the car and showing everybody that you can enjoy your older cars. So it should be a lot of fun.
Now, if you've been following the road to Pebble Beach, to Monterey, I should say, on Motor Trend, you already know about Jason Wenig and the Creative Workshop in Dania Beach, Florida, who were preparing a car working against the clock to bring it here to the 68th Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance. Earlier, Johnny Lieberman spoke with Jason Wenig about the effort. I'm standing here next to a yellow car that's called a Kissel. Um, this guy has been restoring it uh, for a program. I'm going to have him tell you about this car. Hi, Jason. How you doing? What is this? Standing next to a 1921 Kissel Model 645, affectionately nicknamed Goldbug, which you could probably understand the reason why. And uh, you brought it out here as part of a program you're doing, uh, the Road to Monterey. Long Road to Monterey. Long Road to Monterey. Yep. And, um, Obviously, you've been filming this car for quite a while, getting it built. I got to ask, what what's it been like? Tell me about like getting the car sorted and then driving it out here. Well, going through the process of restoring a car is exhaustive. Every nut and bolt of this entire vehicle has been taken apart and put back together again. Knowing that it was coming to Pebble Beach, you have to pay attention to the details. Sure. And we obsess over those details. So every single screw, nut and bolt, color finish and thing you see has about hours, five hours plus for every hour of work. Right. So what you're seeing is the culmination of a remarkable amount of work by a coordinated group of craftsmen to make it on the field today. But uh, like you, I'm in the TV biz. So you not only do you have to like work on the car, but then you have a bunch of other guys standing around then telling you like, perfect, <laughs> do it again. What's that like? Well, you know, you try to do things once and there's nothing quite like when you try to put something like an engine in a chassis and have the producers walk up and say, great, now take it out and put it back in again. So great, but mm. <laughs> right, right. got to get the different angle. Get the different angle. Yeah, yeah, we live in the same world. Well, let me ask you, though, because uh, I imagine none of this is easy, but what has been the single most difficult or arduous or, or, or heartbreaking thing that happened getting this car ready? Well, I could probably say taking it for a test drive 10 days before the transport truck came and me breaking the windshield and having the TV show capture that on camera. <laughs> I heard about this. You broke it with your hand? I heard about that. Yeah. So the car stalled. We were having some tuning issues. I leaned up to take a look inside to see if my engine was on fire or not. When I leaned back, I pulled the windshield back with me. And I'm going to assume you don't go to like Pep Boys and get a new windshield for this car. Right, right. So. I think we all handled it pretty well, but there was a lot of bleeps going on on that camera at that moment. So we obviously got it done in time. So, Well, very cool. Thanks for talking to me, and uh, good luck, man. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Just vote for us now. Now it's time to win an award. I don't vote. <laughs> well, now you know how it ended, but if you haven't checked out The Long Road to Monterey, you can find it now on Motor Trend TV, and you'll see it in a special premiere on the Velocity Network September 11th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Now we move on to Class T as the Scarabs, which were not a judged class, have come and gone. These are the Tuckers. And on the ramp there is first in class, 1948 Tucker 48. And this car is owned by George Lucas. Of course, there's a Hollywood connection because uh, the, the um, Francis Coppola also owns a Tucker right. 48. A fascination with these unique American cars, which of course spawned a movie. That's right. Coppola made the film Tucker, The Man and His Dream. Truly interesting car. Uh, you know, a, a, a Lycoming flat six engine at the rear. Uh, that center light swiveled so you would show around corners. Um, and of course, those of you who have seen the movie will know that there was quite a controversy about uh, what happened to Preston Tucker. Uh, all I can say is that there's a very, very fine line between being Henry Ford and Preston Tucker. A few bad decisions. This is an industry that chews up so much money so quickly. And when things go wrong, they go very wrong. The film stars Jeff Bridges. If you haven't seen it, give it a try. And now here's another special class of a competition nature, celebrating the rear engine revolution at the Indianapolis 500 mile race in the 1960s and 70s. So they're gonna break with tradition here, I think, and push these cars up onto the ramp, because these are fairly highly strung race cars. They're also yes, very, very low to the ground. 
This class, Class V, is one of two classes curated here at Pebble Beach this year by my very good friend Ken Gross, and he has a wonderful eye for cars. The Tuckers, we've just seen, it's the greatest gathering of Tuckers I think that there has ever been and ever likely to be. And these 1960s Indy cars, uh, some of the best and most memorable races from the famous 500 mile of the early 1960s. Here is the first of the cars to be pushed up on stage. This is the third place car in class, a 1966 All-American Racers Eagle Special from Dan Gurney's All-American Racer Shops in Santa Ana, California. And Dan Gurney was a man of impeccable taste and it showed in his race cars that were always beautiful race cars. The, the little point on the nose there, the blue and white livery, it was just perfect, whether it was his Indy car or his, his Grand Prix car, which of course he competed in Formula One with. And uh, no mean feat too to attempt to be uh, win a championship, win a race in a car of your own design. There's only one person, of course, who's ever done that, and, uh, Jack Brabham. Dan Gurney did it on the 1967 Formula One Grand Prix of Belgium at Spa. Now this car was driven by Dan Gurney the first of his engine uh, Indianapolis cars, I should say, in 1966, he didn't get very far. There was a start line crash. He got caught up in it, and his race was over. But it raced on. The car is now owned by renowned restorer Bruce Canapa from Scotts Valley here in Northern California. I had a long chat with Bruce. He went through a meticulous set of steps to make sure that everything was just as it should be on this car. And now here's another special class of a competition nature, celebrating the rear end revolution at the Indianapolis 500 mile race in the 1960s. First in class goes to the 1965 Dean Van Lines Brawner Special. Patience is, everybody knows is a virtue, and this is going to be worth waiting for. I've heard this car before, it sounds fabulous. And the ethanol smells good too. The 2018 Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance live stream is brought to you by Haggerty, for people who love cars. By Jaguar, the art of performance. Joining me now here on our commentary stage is Eric Bizek, host of JDM Legends on Motor Trend and Velocity Networks, and a key man behind one of the newest elements of the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance, JAI, the Japanese Automotive Invitational. Eric, tell me what that's all about. So the Japanese Automotive Invitational is something that uh, Infinity has had a part in producing and, and what we're trying to do is uh, show and display some of the, you know, the, the great uh, motorsports heritage, you know, the great design, you know, some of the designs that came out of Japan. You know, finally getting on the stage where, where these cars can be appreciated the way that we think they can. There's some very incredible cars that, that were available over there and, and you know, a lot of these are still very accessible to you know, some of your average guys. So I think it's a, it's a great way to really get into the marketplace without having to spend, uh, you know, six figures on a budget, so. Where is this all coming from? I mean, when people think of Japanese cars, I don't mm -hmm. know that they particularly think of luxury or performance until events like drifting came about. And suddenly we saw these cars really <coughs> capable of extraordinary things. And certainly in road racing, even involved in oval track racing around the world, the Japanese are right there and have been for a long time. So is this overdue, this recognition? It's long overdue. You know, they, like I said, they've been in Japan and, and really didn't get into the outside motorsports until, you know, a little later than most manufacturers. So, you know, there's cars like we see today, the R35 GTR, incredible car, but you trace that back to 1969 is when that car started. And uh, 1969, that car had four valves per cylinder, dual overhead cam, triple carbureted motor, you know, revving to 8,000 RPMs, I mean, how can you not like that, you know? So for me, that's, that's really what, what drew me into it. Right on. Uh, it, it, this is the first year for the, for the initiative, the JAI. What does the future hold, do you see? You know, it's tough to say. I mean, the first car to really get serious recognition is the Toyota 2000 GT, which definitely deserves it. But I think there is, you know, a, a, a lot of cars that, that came out of there. Very interesting, either for, you know, the design elements or for just sheer uh, technological advancements. You know, they, they've always been, uh, on the forefront of, of, you know, the highest technology available at the time. And, and I think, you know, that's something that 
I'm really excited to see uh, come to light, you know, and, and have people finally uh, see them for what they are. I can't let you go without asking about your personal impressions of what you see here on the show field at Pebble. You know, this has been absolutely incredible for me. You know, I, I've, I've been to car shows before, but this is, I mean, they say the Super Bowl of car shows, but it's, it's no joke. I mean, not even on the grass, but just all of the cars driving around the event, you know, to see McLaren's parallel park next to, you know, uh, Enzo's. I mean, it's like uh, everywhere I look, I have a hard time really, you know, I feel bad for my wife because we're trying to have a conversation, but there's so <laughs> many distractions, you know, so. Oh, that never yeah. happens. <laughs> well, Incredible it's event. I appreciate you taking the time to come chat with us and enjoy the rest of the day. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. And now let's join Ed Lowe standing by at the Concept Lawn here at Pebble Beach Golf Links. So I'm here at one of my favorite spots at the Concorde d'Elegance weekend, the Concept Lawn. And with me is a stunning debut here, the Audi PB18, along with its designer, Gail Borzin. Come in here and tell me all about your beautiful creation. Well, what we wanted to do is create the car for the enthusiast driver of tomorrow. So our goal was to give the driver the closest experience to the one of a race car driver as possible. We think ultimately when you buy a supercar, that's what you're trying to have as an experience. So we leverage the drive-by-wire technology, for example, on the interior and created a driving cockpit that can slide over the passenger seat and put the driver in the middle, which is the purest position for a race car driver. It's fantastic. As you can see, it slide over. So it goes from a two-passenger vehicle to a single-seat race car. It's got uh, the electric battery packs in the back. It's all electric, makes about 670 horsepower, and apparently goes 0 to 60 in under two seconds. It's fantastic. There are plenty of other concept cars here that we would go check out. Let's go see them. So what I love about the concept lawn is that it's this mix of race cars and production cars and concepts. We have vehicles like the Jaguar I-Pace trophy car, the VW IDR. This is uh, one the Pikes Peak uh, set the lap record up there. Also, we have uh, production cars like the 600 LT from McLaren. This is their super sports car, long tail edition. And then beautiful concepts like the Genesis Essentia. This didn't debut here. This debuted back at an international show, uh, but it's gorgeous out here on the lawn. And then again, there's production cars like the Levante Trofeo. And of course, you can't come here and not appreciate cars like the Lamborghini Aventador SVJ 63. Only 63 of these are going to be made. Uh, limited edition, also a debut here at Pebble Beach. We pop over and we can see cars like the um, the Wolf Fenier concept car. This is sorry, this is a production car. It's from Dubai, uh, designed and made in Italy, right alongside the Infiniti P10. This is a follow up to their P9 prototype. Beautiful single post concept car, right alongside the Polestar 1, another gorgeous, uh, you know, near production vehicle. What's really great though is the absolute diversity here. Uh, concept cars everywhere you look. But what is actually my favorite is that I believe this is the first time there's a pickup truck here at the Concept Car Lawn. This is from uh, VW, the Atlas Tan Oak. And actually, I think it's right at home here at the Concept Lawn. Back to you guys. And now while we have a moment, let's chat with McKeel Haggerty, CEO of Haggerty Insurance, a longtime supporter of classic cars everywhere, and particularly of the Pebble Beach Congur d'Elegance. McKeel, you're not only a judge, a long-term judge, you are also an entrant here this year. What kind of added pressure does that bring? Well, I've, I felt sort of like, you know, when you'd see the, the image of the circus bear juggling and riding the <laughs> unicycle at the same time, uh, that was my day today. Um, so, you know, judging it brings a lot of pressure of its, of its own because these are some of the finest automobiles in the world and the judging teams are brought in to be true experts, I guess, and we study hard, try to be ready. And then I have this added problem of jumping back and forth to have my own car being judged. Um, but it was, that was a lot of fun today. It was, a, it was a real honor to be here as a participant for once. Tell me about your car. Yeah, it was, it's a 1931 Cadillac, uh, Cadillac 16, which was a 16-cylinder car. And, uh, you know, we all like to think that we know the cars in our hometown. I live in a small town in northern Michigan where we're headquartered. And here was this little treasure trove of pre-war classics sitting three miles from my house. And there was a Cadillac 16 sitting out there. So I convinced the owner to let it move from his garage to my garage. This is obviously a big weekend for Haggerty Insurance. Uh, let's talk about the big picture. A lot of auctions going on. Yeah. The, the, you know, 
of the market for collector cars being set here this weekend. What do you see happening out there? Well, there are six different auctions taking place. I mean, you have all these events out here in addition to the Concours, which is the you know granddaddy and the kind of cornerstone of the whole thing, the modern day historic races. Um, everybody was coming in here wondering how would the how the auctions do this year? You know, what does the market look like? That there was a high water mark set back in 2014 of huge volume of cars sold. Um, this was a big year. It did uh, very, very well. The auctions were really hot at the, at both at it, in interesting dimensions, both at the high end, as you'd expect. This is a real high end place. So big, big gun sports racing cars, Ferraris in particular, tend to do well here. Uh, but pre-war classics did well, you know, showing there's a new generation interested in pre-war classics. Modern supercars uh, did well. And strangely, newer cars with really low miles. Um, so there were some fascinating trends taking place, but a whole new generation. And, and in fact, new generations of collectors are here uh, buying cars at auction, showing them on the field, um, having a good time. So uh, I love it. It's great to see. This may seem like kind of an off-the-wall question, but what the heck. Uh, given the political climate and the markets, tariffs, trade war, all that sort of thing, is that something that might affect the classic car business, car restoration and so forth, where materials and craftsmanship are so important to the final product? It certainly could. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of interest and concern about potentially a, a tariff or trade issue with Europe because there's, you know, in the automotive space, the especially in this automotive space, the the uh, interests between kind of American or North American car interests and European interests are important, uh, both in new cars, of course, you know, we love European cars, uh, but also in vintage cars. And um, that was a real concern for a lot of the market. It seems to have settled down a bit. Um, but, you know, in reality, you know, this is a, this is the only car event this week in Monterey is the only car event that takes place that's truly global. I mean, there are people from all over the world, North America, South America, Asia, Europe, uh, Africa, um, and that's what it kind of shows the global interest in cars are what makes it interesting. And as these generations grow, you know, not whether, even though maybe there's a smaller percentage of people interested in cars in the same way we saw just even a couple of decades ago, the generations are so large that there's, there's great interest in them. So, you know, I think What's important for all of us, I mean, what you guys are doing, what we're thinking about is how do we make this a fun, friendly place for people to get into cars, whether they're into racing or restoring or showing, who cares? I don't care. Um, it's got to be a friendly place, and you got to remove the barriers for people to be able to do it and, like you said, find parts, get cars restored, have fun with it. I have spoken to at least two officials with organizations planning new Concours d'Elegance. How far can the market go? How many cars are there out there? I mean, is there a limit at some point, or can this hobby continue to grow as it has to this point? Well, you know, we, we saw the great, you know, the uh, the Japanese car uh, event that took place here that, mm -hmm. you know, you, we were involved with you guys with, which yep. is awesome, showed a whole new level of interest. I think uh, from an event standpoint, it's, uh, it's a little less about concourse than it was a few years ago. And obviously the cars and coffee world has sort of taken over the car planet. And I think it's what's a, what's cool about cars and coffee is they're they're lightweight. You know, no one has to be the club secretary or print the newsletter to go to a cars and coffee. You just you bring to a parking lot somewhere uh, what you have and you have some fun with it. And you know, my guess is you're probably gonna see something that you might want and then you might upgrade to that. And then you you know, ten ten AM you go drive away it's it's pretty lightweight so what we're seeing is more ad hoc type events more ways for people to connect um, differently and in a in a more casual way rather than in a formal way there's a place for concours because people are by nature competitive in the car world they want to show their best stuff and have it judged against something else and uh, then uh, otherwise it's uh, just go out there and have a good time Last question, where can I get a motoring cap like that? Well, you know, I'm a Kangle guy, and uh, <laughs> I don't have as much hair as you do. Uh, so uh, I have to have this. That's this is a, a requirement. That's a good thing today. So. Keel Haggerty, thank you very much for your support of the, of the Concord d'Elegance and continued success in 2018. Thank you. All the best. We'll take a break and return with more from the 68th Pebble Beach Concord d'Elegance. Isn't it time you connected to something greater? Sometimes the best way to connect is to disconnect. This moment of escape was brought to you by Haggerty for people who love cars.
Welcome back to the Pebble Beach Golf Links and the 68th Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance here on Motor Trend. I'm Bob Varsha, along with Angus McKenzie, Ed Lowe, Johnny Lieberman, and Alan Decadene. Thanks for being with us on another beautiful day, another collection of absolutely fabulous automotive treasures. And there's more to come here at Pebble Beach. We have met all of our class winners, and now the judges will get their heads together, and Angus, to talk about what qualifies for best in show. And I think this brings out the nuances of judging in this con uh, competition, because everybody really has their own perception of what constitutes a best in show vehicle. And all the best in show winners are you know, incredible cars. They are cars that have been restored meticulously or preserved wonderfully. They're cars that are uh, absolutely authentic, they're period correct. So it's like picking one of your children really, isn't it? And, um, but I think there is a certain type of car, and we've seen this over the years, that really does appeal at Pebble Beach. Uh, a car that has a certain indefinable presence when it's up there on the ramp. And um, I think we can hazard a guess at some of the cars that uh, might do well uh, from this really class crowd. I can't emphasize how impressed I am with the quality of the cars overall this year. It's been a fantastic array of really impressive vehicles. I'm glad you mentioned hazarding a guess because that's exactly what I'd like our entire panel to do right now, a prediction of best of show. Alan, let's start with you. Well, I'm torn between two cars. Uh, there's a 1929 Mercedes-Benz SS, the 710. I had that car in my garage 40 years ago. I couldn't afford the uh, three or 4,000 pounds he wanted for it. So I had to let it go. But it, you look what that car did. It won the, uh, the TT, it won the Millimilia, Rudolf Caracciola, say no more. However, I also am an alpha man, really. And the 2900B, uh, that is the car that I did a show on. I, I love that car. And it, the gentleman who owns it is as meticulous as can be. And so I suppose out of those two, I have to root for the Alpha Man. <laughs> okay, Angus, how about picking one? Well, I'm gonna go with the uh, Hartman body Cadillac. To me, that has everything that a, uh, a Pebble Beach best of show winner should have. It has the flamboyant body style with those enclosed fenders, a V16 engine Cadillac. It's, it's a gilded age car. It's extravagant, it's 22 feet long, two-door convertible. And when it's up there on the ramp, and I was out earlier this, this morning out there on the lawn, and this car had a crowd around. It's a crowd pleaser. It's like a magnet everyone draws around. So I think it has that, that sort of stage presence that a Pebble Beach Best of Show winner needs. Well chosen. My ballot is already in the hat for that very same car, which I think is probably unrepeatable. And absolutely fantastic. Ed Lowe, how about you? Well, thanks, Bob. I, I really think it has to be the, um, the Mercedes-Benz, that 29 uh, 710 SS Barker Tour. You know, it has everything you want in, in a car that's shown here. Uh, it's, first of all, it's, it's gorgeous. Uh, I love that it's a preservation class, and it's, I hope that it can be the first of, its, of the kind to win Best in Show. Um, and it has that history. You know, it won, it won the Millimilia. Uh, Rudolf Caracciola, you know, the, the one of the own, one of two uh, foreigners, non-Italians, to win the race. So in my mind, you know, that has, you know, all the right pieces to win if the Cadillac doesn't win. But how about you, Johnny? What do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, if that Cadillac catches on fire, uh, I'm going to go, I mean, there's a lot of great cars, but I'm going to go with that, uh, the 1929 Duesenberg J, the Murphy limousine. Uh, it had a white top, black body. It was just, you know, it's, it's got the elegance part of Concorde elegance. You know, it's long, formal, just what you want to be seen out on the town. Like, imagine you're leaving the dealership in New York in 1931. Everybody's selling apples, and you're, you know, imperiously cruising down the road in that. Like, 
it's it's the car if the Cadillac somehow doesn't make it. Well, it sounds like the Cadillac is the early front runner as far as we're all concerned. I think so. As I said, it has uh, it ticks all the boxes for a Pebble Beach uh, car, and you know we've been coming here for a few years now. We've seen the sort of cars that uh, go up on the ramp and uh, get the best of show accolade, and uh, it really does tick the boxes. Well, when the judging comes down to a tie, if it does, there is a potential tiebreaker. And it's an event that began here at the Pebble Beach Concord Elegance several years ago called the Tour de Elegance, an opportunity for the owners of these cars on the show field behind us to get out on the road to show a much wider audience about these fabulous cars that may not be able to make it onto the property here at the Pebble Beach Golf Links. And then there is that tiebreaker. Here's Alan to explain. So you've worked hard, you've passed your driving test and you're now licensed to drive just about anything with four wheels. With a bit of luck, you might get yourself into a beauty like this new Mercedes-Benz. Does all the thinking for you. Power brakes, power steering, and all the wonderful things to help you get very, very safely where you want to go. On the other hand, if you want to drive a car like this, it's not quite the same. No power steering, no power brakes, and as for changing gear, well, it's called double declutching. You have to put the gear lever into neutral, rev up the engine, and try to get the lower gear. It's not easy. The gentleman that drives this car teaches people how to use it. But here at Pebble Beach, we're going to have something over 200 cars that will be doing the Tour d'Elegance. That is only something you'll get to see here at Pebble Beach. So all these gorgeous cars that have just finished the Tour d'Elegance have been down what I think is one of the greatest drives in the whole of North America, the coast road from Pebble Beach to Big Sur. Lucky guys. However, there's a little bit more to it. Because if when the judges judge these cars for class winner and one of them has been on this tour and finished it, that car will get preference for the win. So in other words, there's a little bit more to this Tour d'Elegance than we realized when we started. I'm sitting here with Monvendra Singh, sir. Very nice to see you. Pleasure being you here. You were responsible for the Raj class. Yes, I've, uh, I've helped Sandra with the curating the Raj class, bringing nine cars out of India and further four more out of the United States and China. So. Could you tell us, what's the biggest challenge about putting together a, a new class at, at Pebble? Uh, the, one of the most difficult things is, of course, your government regulations, both India and United States. Now that they've become so friendly, it's easier to bring the cars in. Otherwise, earlier it was not possible at all. Uh, the last time we got three cars, which much difficulty. It takes five to six months paperwork to get the cars clear. But this time it was a little bit easier than the last time, so I was able to bring nine cars representing India's spectrum from 1921 to 1947 in different body styles. Is there a particular area, uh, or era, I guess I should say, that you're more fond of, like the earlier? I know like some of those old original Rolls Royces are just spectacular. Yes, the reason being that I had to make sure that I don't overload it with Rolls Royces because India was a very big market for Rolls Royces. Yeah, right, for tiger hunting and that kind yes, of thing. Yes, <laughs> yes. One third production of Rolls Royces between 1912 and 1947 landed in India, so you can imagine what a great market it was. Wow, that's incredible. So, what, uh, is there a particular car there that's a favorite of yours? I know that we've seen the class winner, but... Uh, not really, because I've been associated with many of these cars, but there is a, a, a definitely a Lagonda, which, had, uh, which is a, a replica of the Le Mans winning car, which I've driven quite a bit, so that's one of my favorite cars. Very good. Well, thank you very much. It's been a it's real been honor a to, to, to uh, not only interview you, but also just a joy to look at the cars. They were thank fantastic. you so much. Okay. Great to be here. All right, boys, we're going to throw it back to you. All right, thanks very much, Johnny. Now, going on on stage right now is some charity fundraising, which is also a big part of every year's Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance. Over a million dollars a year is raised for local charities, and I think the, uh, the Concours is justifiably proud of that, Angus. Absolutely. I mean, the 
people come here, they give generously. You know, they've had the opportunity to see some absolutely wonderful cars. There's a great atmosphere here too. And people mix and, and get together and talk about cars. And this is an opportunity for the hobby, for those that really enjoy these cars to give back to the community. And uh, it's something that the organizers are indeed very proud of. Now we are waiting for the tabulations to continue toward best of show, and we have them. We'll certainly bring them to you. It's the climax of the entire day here at the Concours d'Elegance. Right now we're going to join Ed Lowe. So I'm here with a very special guest, the master of ceremonies, Derek Hill. And I, Derek, I know you've been coming here for a number of years, but, but how long? Uh, you know, I hate to say it, I've been coming here my whole life. Yeah, this was the family vacation every summer. Uh, my father obviously was very involved in car restoration and as, an, as a judge. And uh, we, well, as kids, we loved coattailing along with him. It's fantastic. So it's, it's been so many years, and lately you've become, you know, the, the voice of the master of ceremonies here. Um, is, it, is it still special for you? It's incredibly special. In fact, I've, I've only grown to appreciate it more and more every year as my role has gone from being an entrant to being a judge and now to be on the ramp with the best seat in the house. Uh, I, I love it and I feel like I sense that enthusiasm amongst the collectors and the people who come to see the show. It's fantastic. So what is, uh, what's your favorite thing, uh, the, the must-see activity here at the Concorde d'Elegance? Well absolutely you have to go check out the concept lawn. I love to see all the manufacturers bringing out their latest new creative concept uh, and just really wowing the media, wowing the attendees. And then of course you have to go take a walk around the lawn and see which cars have been entered into the show and, and, and try and figure out which ones might be contenders for the best of show. Absolutely. Well, best of luck today, Derek, and back to you guys. Well, that of course was Derek Hill, son of the great Phil Hill, and as I mentioned earlier in our broadcast, the longtime MC here at the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance. That interview was recorded earlier today, and it all makes for a very long day for Derek. It is a long day. It's a long day for all of us. I can remember coming to Pebble Beach as a, as a journalist uh, years ago, and you used to come here, look at some great cars, have some great conversation, have some great meals. Now I have to work. <laughs> What's gone wrong? <laughs> Where does the time go? We used to be able to really stretch our legs and enjoy ourselves, but now it's just go, go, go. The action continues on the stage, raising funds for charity while the tabulation continues. Of course, the real reason folks are hanging around, in addition to the fact that Jay Leno is a part of those charity fundraising, is because we await the best of show results. But in the meantime, let's catch up with our buddy Alan Decadene. This is a wonderful 1921 Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost. It was bought new by the Wankaneer family in India. The Maharaja of Wankaneer bought it. They've had it in the family ever since it was new. It has never been restored. Just have a look at this car. It's in the most delicious, uh, very recoverable, but there it is in its beautiful, delicious original state. And the lady sitting in the rear here, it's her family who have owned the car ever since it was new. That'll shortly be a hundred years old. You have to wonder how many families have owned a car for nearly a hundred years. And they've sent it over here so that we can all enjoy it at the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance. All right, thanks very much, Alan. Now we'd like to join our colleagues, Ed Lowe and Johnny Lieberman. So Ed, as we're waiting for the winners, has there been any moments today that have really stood out to you? Yeah, you know, um, I think we've seen a lot of great clips uh, during this broadcast, but really, uh, you know, Eric's interview talking about JAI, the Japanese Automotive Invitational, uh, has a special place in my heart. Um, we, we had this conversation with um, Phil O'Connor at Infinity at the LA Auto Show, and we talked about, you know, how do we make, you know, this event even better? How do we, how do we make it something that uh, maybe brings in a, a different demographic, uh, some younger enthusiasts? You know, because when you, when you come out, to the lawn on Sunday, and you see all this, all these beautiful cars, all these beautiful people. You know, the, you know how much you know goes into this. You know, I feel like the bar is is is, is really high. There's a barrier to, to entry here if you want to be a, a collector, get into this scene, and hopefully by bringing out um, 
you know, some more accessible, more affordable, uh, more slightly more relatable vehicles, more modern, newer. Uh, in the in the Japanese uh, you know realm, we can get more people to come and enjoy uh, this spectacular. Event. And that's a great point because you know I had a guy on, uh, hit me up on Instagram and he goes, "Hey, can normal people go to this, or do you have to be a special person?" I'm like, "No, anybody's free to come, but it, there's just this kind of mental barrier to getting here." Exactly, and it really is for everybody. Exactly, and what what I really loved about you know both uh, the JAI and other events here is that you do see uh, when you do see young people, they are very engaged um, with with the content. There, I saw a lot of people with their phones out, Instagramming, Facebook living, maybe vlogging to YouTube or whatever. And, and that's what we need. We need more people to get involved and, and be exponents uh, you know, of, the, of this great scene. Yeah. But, but how about for you? I had, I had two moments that really stood out. One was uh, back to that, that great Cadillac, that Hartman Cadillac, where I was looking at the car next to it, which is a beautiful V16 Cadillac, which at any other Concorde in the world would win just for showing up. It was that high quality. And there's 50 people looking at the white Hartman. No one's even looking at it because it's the, you know the 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 Hartman's such an eyeball magnet you know and so that really struck me as like which is it's an embarrassment of riches right but then the other moment was you know Tucker is a special class here right um, and it's amazing so you know the most Tuckers would ever be together all that but I was looking at that that rainbow green Ruxton oh yeah and I could see the Tuckers behind it right. and there were you know. There was 99 Ruxtons made. There was only like 51 Tuckers, and I go, everyone goes gaga for the for the Tuckers, but there's twice as many Ruxtons, sure. and they're even wilder. So sure. it was it was a really good moment, and and that's what's so cool about Pebble Beach is that it can be filled with that. You know, like I, I love Citroens. They had finally had a, a Citroen class, right? You know, so it's um, it, it, it's one of those things. Like hey, every year we say, well, how are they going to top it? And yep. yet. They top it. Yep. And I have no idea how you top it for next year, but I bet you they top it. You yep. Know? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I look forward to coming to this event every year. All right. Thanks very much, guys. And now it's time to rejoin Alan Decadene. Hardly was World War II over, and poor old Italy, who didn't do so well in it, were constructing every, with any materials they could lay their hands on. This is a Cisitalia, 1947. It's got a Fiat 1100 motor in there and it's got an all aluminum body and if you have a good look at this little car the detail it's typically Italian if Bernini the sculpture didn't have a hand in the design of this and don't forget too that the greatest of drivers Tazio Nuvolari would always have a drive in a Italia if he could all right thank you Alan Angus you and I have been talking and occasionally you will point out that you've driven that car or a car like that and so forth. Of the cars in this year's Concorde d'Elegance, what drive stands out to you that you've made one of these cars? There's one car here that is, is truly, truly special. It didn't make it up onto the ramp. It was an, in, an exhibition car. It wasn't to be judged. It's a car out of the Indianapolis Museum. It is the Watson Roadster in which Parnelli Jones won the 1963 Indy 500. Now, I've known about that car since I was eight years old because my uncle had a Floyd Clymer Indianapolis 500 yearbook, and that car was on the cover. And in 2011, I got the opportunity to drive that car at Indy. Oh, and Parnelli Jones was there too. He also drove the car, and it was the first time he'd sat in it since 1964. But for me personally, I've driven a lot of cool cars over my career, but that is probably one of the greatest moments to drive around the legendary brickyard in a car that won the race. I'll say it again, you have a great job. <laughs> We've got another break coming up as we await the tabulation for Best of Show. You won't want to miss the ceremony that follows the big reveal, so stick around and we'll be back to the Pebble Beach Golf Links after this. The ultimate driving machines really do deserve the ultimate driving weekend. This race is underway. Okay, let's get that. that I know you're all wondering about. What is it like to have 755 horses under your right foot? We're gonna go drag racing, pulling tractors. Yeah, 
those will work. Joining me now is a longtime personal friend who also happens to be a motorsports legend and a longtime honorary judge here at the Pebble Beach Concord d'Elegance, five-time Le Mans 24 Hours winner, Derek Bell. Derek, great to see you here. And you too, Bob. It's been a while. I wasn't aware that you have a long history as an honorary judge here. In fact, you're also a chief honorary judge for one of the crews out there, so you vote for best of show. <laughs> Heavy responsibility, is it? It's very, very easy for us. I, I. I'm not an expert, none of us are an expert. There are experts out there, they go along and check that every nut and bolt is the right size, the right color, and all the rest of it, and the paint stuff of the under, underpaint and things like that. For us, we just go along and aesthetically look at it and say, that's a magnificent looking car. And then on top of that, of course, we then have to judge its Palmares against maybe like today, we're judging 16 different Oscars. And people are gonna say, what's an Oscar? You know, is it one of those things you win when you're a good actor? <laughs> but in this case, they're beautiful Italian cars way back from in the 50s and 60s that the Maserati brothers decided to create. And they look like they smaller Maseratis than we're used to, and they're all ide pretty much identical. And, lo and it's just amazing to meet these different owners with their beautiful little cars, and then try and analyze and work out what has the best credentials. Phil Hill drove that one, you know, uh, Dan Gurney drove that one. You go, wow, okay, and they realize they're pretty special. What goes on during the discussion among your judging crew when you're looking at the cars and people are making their own individual decisions about what they're seeing? Well, basically, I mean, you look at them and you, and you go, oh, this is going to be easy until you realize that each one has got, each one's done, you know, 57 races, another one's done 97, another one's done this rally and that rally. And then you have to look and then you suddenly have, you find a car in there that's special that stands out a bit more than the others. And you think, thank goodness for that, because, and, 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 and you look through them all and you know, the, it's the car that maybe went to Europe and had a V8 engine put in it that the others didn't have. And then it went out and had a go at Bonneville when it came back to America. And you realize it was a very versatile piece of, of technology. And the other cars were just used as not even a road car on a daily basis, but you know, running classic races and all about the country. And they, they did Sebring 12 hours and that, they've all got a history. It's quite remarkable. So we're looking at that. And then I can't help but not want to look at a car that looks like it just came off the drawing board and out of a, f a factory where it's been highly polished. I want, we, I think, believe because they're, they're racing cars-ish, we want to see that they've actually got, look like they've had a racing career somewhere. Not that they've never done anything. You look and, oh, we never did any racing, did a few laps at a certain circuit. And you go, that's not quite it, what it's about. We are here to look at raw cars. You know, we want to, we want to look at the cars and then say, ultimately, when it's difficult, say, uh, okay, so which car would you like to take home today? <laughs> and that really is the answer. So all around, you know, the, the history of it, and then what do you think is the prettiest, best, and the car you like to drive? Well, it's great to see you here, and thanks for your hard work making those kinds of decisions. It's fun. It's fun. It's sometimes in the between the, when you get the Italians and the English fighting and the French butting in about their favorite, it gets a bit tricky, but it's fun. <laughs> Thank you. That's my great friend, Derek Bell. There's a look at a beautiful Rolls Royce which somehow brings to mind our colleague, Alan DeCadene. Alan? A 1959 Citroën DS DS19. This is a Berlin d'usine. That's a f Berliner, a coupe of the factory. But not only is that quite a rare car, it was built down to a price. But d the French would say not DS, but DS. And what is a DS in French? A goddess. That was really the secret to these cars. They were goddesses. They are beautiful cars indeed, Alan. And Angus, you've been eyeballing these Citroëns all weekend. The 1955 Paris show, the Citroën DS appeared for the very first time. And instantly, it made every other car on the road look obsolete. And I don't think there's been a production car launched in the world at any time in the history of the automobile that has made all its contemporaries look so old fashioned. Not only did the car have that unbelievable styling, it had hydro pneumatic suspension. It had um, the ability, the unbelievable ride quality 
uh, it had uh, clutchless manual transmissions. It, it was just so far ahead of its time. The DS is arguably the greatest production car of all time, in my humble opinion. I know Johnny Lieberman agrees with me. Believe it or not, a friend of mine in high school had one of those DS with that suspension, and you could actually raise and lower the front end of the car using the controls, so I guess that was perhaps one of the original lowriders. Well, they had no jack. If you wanted to change a tire, what you did was you, jack, you raised the car up, you put a little um, stand into a hole in the side, and then you lifted the suspension, you dropped the suspension down, and it would lift the tire off the... <laughs> And to change the wheel on the back, you had to take the rear fender off. The whole fender came off, and then you changed the wheel. Of course, they had the single-spoke steering wheel, and you know they, they, everything about them was different. They're wonderful cars. Absolutely, glad to have them here at Pebble Beach. Uh, meanwhile, the tabulation continues, and we're still waiting for the final decision, the puff of smoke up the chimney, if you will, that we are ready to present best of show. At which point. The final three nominees for that great honor will be presented, and one will take best of show. And the celebrations will begin. You'll want to be here for that. A little high cloud overhead, beginning to cool down just a little bit here at Pebble Beach. We've just seen one of the uh, two Chinese cars here at Pebble Beach this weekend just drive past us. And that's the first time there's ever been Chinese cars on the lawn here at Pebble Beach. They're the giant Hongqi limousines. And Hongqi were built by First Earth Auto Works, which, as the name suggests, was China's first automobile company. And they built great big limousines that uh, were used by dignitaries and... Um, I'm very excited that we, for the first time, we've seen those cars here. It's important to the history of the event. And once again, here's Alan Decadene. This is an unbelievable machine. It's a 1970 Ferrari racing sports car, a 512S. It's got a special Pininfarina body on it, looking like a future car. I drove a 512 actually at Le Mans in 1971 the car that Derek Bell drove at Spa in 1970. They were awesome. Five litre V12 fuel injected engine. You can see it in the back there. Gave about 640 horsepower and the race cars would do 225 miles an hour quite happily. Maybe more, maybe 230, I can't remember. But this is a gorgeous one-off prototype, probably built for a show. Right hand drive you notice like the original 512. That is one astonishing piece of machinery. Thank you, Alan. We have one last set of special awards to hand out, the most elegant award presentations. This concours is first and foremost about elegance, and best of show honors often go to one of these most elegant award winners. Our next award is the JB and Dorothy Nethercut Most Elegant Closed Car, which this year goes to the 1937 Alfa Romeo HC2900B Touring Berlinetta. The next award is the J. Human, the Jules Human Most Elegant Open Car. And it's given this year to the 1929 Rolls Royce Phantom 1 Brewster York Roadster. Our next award is the Strother McMinn Most Elegant Sports Car. This is the 1970 Ferrari 512S Modulo Pininfarina Coupe. And our next award is the Gwen Graham Most Elegant Convertible which this year goes to the 1937 Cadillac Series 90 Hartman Cabriolet. Now, one of the pillars of the Concours mission statement, if I can call it that, is spreading the word about classic and collector cars, not only preserving, but telling the stories, creating new fans, a new generation of restorers and owners and and just fans, just enthusiasts of the car. I get asked a lot about you know, what's going to happen with the car hobby. Where are the new enthusiasts coming from? You see here on, at Pebble Beach, you know, Duesenberg's appealed to a generation of people f when they were kids, they were the dream cars of their youth. Um, the, the Ferraris that are so popular from the 50s and 60s are dream cars for a generation. I think where Pebble Beach will go will be uncovering the dream cars for new generations. 
And does the classic car hobby have a future? Absolutely, because you know, as we head to a world where there's going to be electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, those sorts of things, cars that you can actually relate to and interact with are hugely important. Well, we're getting closer and closer to that moment when the final nominees will be presented. The nominees are... A 1929 Duesenberg J. Murphy Town Limousine of Sam Lermer from Palm Beach, Florida. We have a 1937 Alfa Romeo 8C 2900B Touring Berlinetta of David and Ginny Sidorik from Beverly Hills, California. And a 1948 Talbo Lago T26 Grand Sport Figoni Fastback Coupe of Robert Cudella from the Czech Republic. Our favorite 1937 Cadillac did not make the cut. Yeah, that's, that is a shocker, but all the cars we have all been mentioned. The uh, Johnny with the, uh, the, the Murphy body Duesenberg and the, uh, the zipper car that Ed likes so much. So you see on screen there two of the finalists. There's the Murphy body Duesenberg, uh, a really striking car with that two-tone color scheme. There's the beautiful, beautiful Alfa Romeo 2900. Should the, uh, the Alfa Romeo win, it will complete quite a sweep of being the class winner, the winner of the Charles A. Shane Trophy for the most advanced engineering of its era, and should it win best of show, that's a good day. <laughs> it is such a beautiful, beautiful car. You know, the legacy and the heritage of Alfa Romeo, um, that was cutting edge technology, it was cutting edge style. It was a car that really set, moved the boundaries of what was possible in terms of road car development back at the time. The Duesenberg, um, ordered by Captain George Whittle, the, uh, the man who developed so much of Lake Tahoe. And the, the, it has a couple of interesting signature pieces to, on it too. You can see there's a belt line of polished aluminum and that was on many of the Duesenbergs ordered by Whittle. And he actually kept that car until 1939. And uh, that car's been here at Pebble Beach before. As it was shown here in 1971. So back again and in with a chance at best of show. That's quite a story. Well, at this point, we will go to the stage and let the drama unfold. The Best of Show ballots have been collected, and the Best of Show nominees have now been assembled. To my left, you can see those truly elegant cars, which the Best of Show will be identified. Ladies and gentlemen, there is only one Best of Show, and to reveal what car and owner will take home that coveted title and honor, we turn to our chairman, Sandra. Sandra, may I please have the envelope? Are you ready? The 2018 Pebble Beach Concord Elegance Best of Show winner is the 1937 Alfa Romeo 8C 2900B Turing Berlinetta of David and Ginny Sidorik from Beverly Hills, California. Congratulations! To present, to present the Best of Show trophy and ribbon are David Stivers, president of the Pebble Beach Company, and Sandra Button, chairman of the Pebble Beach Concours. It was close. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And before we present the rest of the guests, can you tell us how you feel? feel fabulous. It was close at the end there. Something was going on. It was a long wait at that end. Maybe it was me. Maybe it was the car. That's all right. We forgive these, we forgive these old cars. What a beauty. This is the ultimate accolade in our wonderful world of it is. Concours d'Elegance yeah. for such a, a truly noble effort <laughs> from you. It's the, it is absolutely the World Cup, and, and, and we've, we've worked very hard. I had a wonderful crew on this car, wonderful restoration group, wonderful detailing people. And it's, it's a beautiful piece of artwork. 
Well, here you are then. You've, you've mentored this competition many, many times. Yeah. You've always hoped you might stand a chance of winning yeah. it. You hoped today and your hope has been fulfilled. That dream came true today and it's, it's spectacular. It really is, with a spectacular car done by a spectacular group. Well, uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Yeah. Take it easy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. And there you have it. The 1937 Alfa Romeo HC 2900B Touring Borlanetta. Best of show at the 68th Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance. Well, it surprised us all. There were so many of us convinced that the Cadillac was going to win. I was wrong. Um, Ed did call it out, though, and uh, congrats to him. Uh, it is a fantastic car. Um, equally surprising, there was a post-war car in the final group. That was great to see. And uh, I think a worthy winner um, and a car that's going to be recognized as one of the Pebble Beach greats. The Alfa Romeo 8C2900 really was a cutting edge car. Well, now it's time to start thinking about the 69th edition of the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance and a whole new world of surprises in store. Absolutely. More great cars, more great times, more amazing things to see. Can't wait. How about a final thought, Ed Lowe? I was really swayed by the beautiful um, interview that uh, Alan did with uh, both the owner of the Cadillac and the Alpha. And I said, look, everybody's voting for that Cadillac, but I actually think this Alpha is... Uh, equally if not more stunning so uh, all credit due uh, to our production team and also uh, the owner of the car what a, what a fantastic uh, uh, vehicle i'm also impressed that you not only picked the alpha but you also picked the talbot <laughs> and the mercedes well the, yeah well for that i owe uh, my fiance for, for loving the the, the the glass the sunroof and the uh, and the, the the three headlights it's also a gorgeous car you really really no losers here Okay, well, anyways, August 18th, do it again. August 18th, let's do it again next year. Can't wait. All right, thanks very much, guys. Angus, your final thoughts? A fantastic uh, Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance this year. We've said it before, but the quality of the cars was truly outstanding. Some really interesting classes, the Raj cars, the Tuckers, the Indy cars. I think it was a great, great show. Well, we hope you'll join us again next year. We hope you enjoyed our coverage today. And so for our crew, for... Alan DeCadene, Angus McKenzie, Ed Lowe, and Johnny Lieberman. I'm Bob Varsha. We'll see you next year. So long for now from the 68th Pebble Beach Concord d'Elegance.